Well, thanks yeah, for coming on again here for episode two of uh, How to Be a Contract Climbing Arborist. Boom. In the first, uh, the first episode there, just for a quick recap for people, we discussed uh, some expectations and kind of what it means to be a contract climbing arborist. Sean alluded to how he sets up his business, uh, all of your equipment. We talked about some training, uh, some experience that you should maybe have before you jump into things. Um, you know, what the reality of the job actually is and crew's experience levels, all that kind of stuff. So definitely head back to episode one if you want to check that out. That was a great overview, in my opinion. What do you think? Do you think we covered pretty much everything in that episode as far as... I think so, yeah. Yeah, a lot of considerations as far as, as equipment and, and connection with crews and stuff like that, leadership and communication. So, yeah, I think, mm -hmm. it was a, I think it was a good overview for sure of kind of the day-to-day, -day, if you will. So, yeah. Yeah, that was a big one. The, the communication and leadership stuff keeps coming up a lot. Mm -hmm. So, you'll probably find a common thread uh, if you're listening in a lot of episodes or things we talk about that uh, that break down to, to that really communication is always key. So today in episode two, we're going to go over uh, kind of a business plan and how to find work and market yourself and just all the things that we do. At least we can, I have some experience starting some other small businesses, used to be a photographer and all sorts of different things. I'm always into that kind of stuff. What about you? Did you, you know, as far as an intro goes, we'll send people back to episode one as far as your kind of deeper background uh, of what you do, but maybe just give us the, the quick, dirty um, experience and then maybe expand a little bit on your experience with just sort of business in that sense, like what kind of background do you have there? Yeah, so, I mean, for those that maybe didn't tune into episode one, my name's Sean Sterna, uh, contract climbing arborist in the Calgary, Alberta, Canada area. Uh, been doing that for, been in residential arboriculture for about 10 years now, uh, background in forestry before that. Uh, heavily involved in fire department, rope rescue, uh, rope access, stuff like that. So a lot of exposure and experience with ropes. It's kind of my life and my passion. Um, beyond kind of the intricate details of the background, uh, from a business perspective, um, once upon a time, some 15 years ago now, <laughs> uh, I actually ran a construction company. Uh, oh, nice. So I kind of specialized in uh, exterior construction and then did some interior renovation kind of general contracting side of things. Uh, so building, woodworking, carpentry, uh, and then acting as general for various other trades, plumbing, electrical, stuff like that uh, for the interior renovation side of things. Uh, so operated that for three, four years. Uh, at the time, it was the perfect match to the full-time ski patrol gig. So you get to do full-time ski patrol all winter, and then you okay. run the construction company for the summer kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and then all of a sudden, life happens. Life? And like You need to start to consider, and... yeah, you need to start considering <laughs> families and children and housing and all these types of things. And no bank is going to look at a seasonal employee for any sort of bank loans or anything like that. So uh, it became time to grow up a little bit uh, and, and seek some full-time employment. And that kind of cascaded its way through. I ended up doing a bunch of um, consulting and, and management stuff uh, through security and emergency management with a couple different big property management companies. So learning the elaborate business side of both large commercial retail uh, as well as commercial high-rise and how that sort of relationship works between various corporations and stuff like that. Uh, and then, yeah, ended up kind of starting my own company probably three years ago, a little over three years ago now, uh, and have been kind of running that. I'm a wonderful company of one person, so <laughs> it's kind of nice from that regard. I don't have to worry too much about other employees or anything like that. But uh, so, yeah, kind of a different myriad of sizing from, you know, the small construction crew of three to four people to you know, staffing of, of 60 to 80 type of people and then uh, all by myself, all by my lonesome. So nice. kind of well, the gambit, if you will. Yeah, for sure. I think that'll relate well to a board culture because it's kind of mm -hmm. still home-based home, uh, home -based service business, uh, same sort of size. Obviously, if you're a contract climber, a lot of people are probably going to be independent uh, totally. or if yep. they have a small tree company or do one of these like hybridized styles maybe that we can talk about today. You may only have a couple people with you. That's kind of what I do with Cochran Tree Care is just have, you know, one or two helpers now, which is great, especially to have them around for some safety and 
save your back a little bit. Uh, I was always scared to get employees um, thinking it's just going to cost too much money and I, you know, didn't know how to look after people and manage them or whatever, but found it's been awesome. I really love just connecting with those people and almost hire them based on their values. And, uh, you know, I really like to explore what they want and to get out of business and then they turn up being awesome people and then you can teach them and they have a good head on their shoulders and they make your job easier. And then you realize you can do less work and you can get more work done. So you earn more money and it's like, oh, wow, why didn't I do this uh, a while ago? <laughs> yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting concept and, and something, I mean, totally to diverge completely from contract climbing and, and what we're kind of talking about. But this concept of, of finding the right people and recruiting and, and finding people that mesh with your values and your belief system uh, is all the recruiting that I've ever been involved with, that's been the key to successful candidates or okay. successful employees or successful, you know, people in the role is finding folks that are passionate, that share your values, and that you can relate to on various different levels. Right. They can have an experience level of zero. Mm-hmm. And as long as they're invested and you share their values and they believe in hard work, uh, you can teach them pretty much anything you need to, right? Awesome. I mean, you... That's... You are an assistant instructor with ArbCan, so you can teach people how to run the saws. You can teach people how to run the ropes. You can teach them all these things. It's it, the difficult piece is finding that engagement and that that interest in actually learning and doing the job. So seek that, and the rest comes. Yeah, I totally agree. It's like the root, right? The root of the tree and all those values and those beliefs and desires and everything. It's kind of hard to change that foundation of people. You know, because they've mm-hmm. already been instilled with that throughout their whole life and uh, have their own things they like and dislike and what they want out of life in general, whether they want to be a leader or they want to be a follower, or whatever. But um, yeah, but I mean, as far as teaching someone how to use some tools safely and uh, work with you, like that can all come on the job fairly quickly <laughs> if they're if Thank they're you. set up already with a good foundation. So totally. that's great yeah. because I was uh, I was kind of doing that sort of through some intuition. Um, and it just sort of worked out, but I didn't, I've never like read anything about that or, uh, like, where did you get some of that training to, where did you learn that? Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily call it training. It's more just real world exposure. Uh, and a lot of that actually came from some of the consulting and the management stuff that I was involved in. Uh, you've got a team of anywhere from 30 to 80 people, depending on at what point in my career and which employer I was working for. But, uh, finding the folks that are engaged in providing a service to a customer they're engaged in you know advancing themselves and bettering themselves these are the kind of traits that we look for yeah and ideally those employees are the ones that are highly sought after by everybody right and so you kind of have to bring your mind to the point where you're going to get three to five years out of these folks they're going to be the best three to five years you've had because they're going to be super bought in and super engaged you're going to in turn provide them with all sorts of education and training and opportunity to advance. And they're going to take all that experience and advance themselves down whichever career path they choose to. And and to me, that's what it's kind of all about, right? It's, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't necessarily, and, and certainly when we were working in the management side of things, my goal was never to find somebody that would be sitting in that chair or at that desk or standing, helping that customer for 30, 40 years. I was I was looking for the people that were hungry and that wanted to invest in themselves and advance and move down whatever career path they had in front of them. So uh, not necessarily any training or education behind it, just real world experience and okay. finding what works best. The folks that are like, yeah, I want to be that ground guy. I want to be that arborist. I want to be whatever. It's like, yeah, okay, that's eager. awesome. There's always a place for that. But in an environment where... I value growth and I value, you know, building on yourself and becoming a better version. Uh, I'm looking for people that are, are wanting to walk that journey with me. So nice. That's great. Great uh, information. I think we'll probably come back to like maybe another episode about that. Maybe if that'd mm-hmm. be a great uh, thing to discuss, like finding employees and, and just looking at those values and maybe ways to go about that. Um, in this episode, because we didn't really mention it already. Uh, maybe in a quick intro before this, if uh, I splice one of those in, but basically we want to go over kind of some actionable things that you can do as far as setting up a business, different ways you can do it, you know, sole proprietorship, being incorporated, 
insurance, WCB, do you need all that kind of stuff? You know, bank accounts, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And then what kind of services do you want to offer? Maybe come up with a bit of a plan of how you want to run this business. Maybe we can jump into that first. Um, mm -hmm. And then from there, we can talk about some charging uh, as far as hourly or by the job or and how that differentiates from uh, tree services. Maybe some hidden costs and uh, and then I have some ideas, some sort of diversity ideas of different things that you can do. Maybe some different training that you can still do independently and add to your business model. Um, not always be contract climbing, which is kind of cool. We talked about that a little bit in last episode as far as when you're a contract climber, you're not just a contract climber 100% mm -hmm. of the time. You're generally this person, even if they hire you as a contract climber, that's all they expect. You kind of also have this... I don't know, subconscious expectation that you know more than them, obviously, unless it's a, a purely a production type thing. Um, but sure. you're going to provide yep. some kind of leadership, uh, problem solving and all these kinds of things. So being prepared for all of that is definitely going to help and probably help you ultimately get more jobs and expand and uh, take on more work if that's what you're looking for. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about work-life balance? I'm just that just came to mind here too because I mean before you get started, maybe I know I booked one or I, or I try to book off one or two days a week not to work. They always get filled up, but thank God they're there because you know things do come up and you also need time to kind of be creative and expand and do different things like these podcasts or whatever it might be. But what do you do for? Uh, do you have a life even? I mean, you're you're doing so much already. Fire captain. You know, contract climber, yeah. instructor, rope access technician, ski patrol it's guy. Part of the nice thing about the contract climbing environment or being independent, if you will, and not having employees or not having these other avenues that you have to concern yourself with from an actual tree care company is if I simply want some time off, I just... I don't can take time off. I don't book a job that week. You know, if I get a phone call from somebody, hey, we've got this spruce tree or we've got this big poplar tree or this elm, whatever it is, uh, I can kind of massage things a little bit. And typically when you build up enough of a rapport and enough of a relationship with these folks, you can be, mm -hmm. you know, hey, I've got something on the go this week or I'm going to be away. Do you want to push it to next week? And usually people are super, super happy about that because they know what they're getting and they know that they're they're getting that that what you mentioned, right? That mm -hmm. educational piece, that leadership piece that comes along with it. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, it's, it's, you can be as busy as you want to be, or you can be as quiet as you'd like to be. Uh, and so for me, I value a lot of the other things that I do, a lot of the diversity that I have. Uh, I value, you know, being involved in the fire department in our community, uh, being involved in ski patrol. Uh, I instruct with a couple different companies. Uh, I do, you know, some rope rescue, some rope access, those types of things. Uh, and I really take pride in the diversity that I have. And so for me, I, I just book my calendar out months in advance. I know that, you know, this particular week here, I've got this training program or this particular week here, I'm over doing this sort of rope access gig. Uh, and I kind of make sure that I've got some time in between all of that to decompress and to catch up with life and, and do the all the other things that, you know, we need to do to kind of de-stress and catch up with ourselves and our families. But, um, yeah, it's, you can be as busy as you want to be. I mean, it's, it's, I particularly, I know that my summer months, if you will, like call it April slash May until October, right, uh, we're I know they're just going to be packed hundred percent. Yeah. We've got a whole bunch of snow out on the ground right now and you work in the snow. It's not a big deal, but it's definitely easier and frankly, a little bit better for the customer to do it in the summer. Uh, yeah. you get, don't have to do as much cleanup in the winter, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. I totally it's digress. Gonna, oh, man, I've had a few jobs where it's like, oh, shoot, I, I hope it snows tonight. <laughs> it's really <laughs> it's hard to pick. Pine needles this everywhere. Look, this doesn't look good. Yeah, I yeah. can only rake the snow so much into balls yeah, when it's exactly. melting. Well, exactly. I mean, it's you're just raking the stuff into the snow. You're not actually collecting anything. But... Uh, I happen to know that my summer is just going to be packed and it's, yeah. it's, it's just, you know, it's something that I know is coming. So I look to take some more time off. Like I kind of took most of January and a lot of this February off, uh, just to kind of decompress and catch up on things and do that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think yeah, you just kind of, you find the times when you can and accept the busy times when they come sort of thing. So for sure. I like that too. It's, it's kind of a weird 
thing being seasonal. I don't know if other guys are seasonal out there or if they, they probably have a busier season and a slower season, at least where you can kind of catch up and, mm -hmm. you know, heal yourself up a bit. I, hopefully <laughs> in time for the <laughs> yeah. busy season again. Okay. So, exactly. um, thinking through the lens of, you know, somebody that's new or has a bit of experience here, that's going to be starting up a business or considering it, uh, as a contract climber. Um, yeah, before you get started, it's hard to look that far out, but you know, it's something to consider maybe right away how busy you do want to be. Um, mm -hmm. but that can easily be controlled. I think once you get going, so it's not a, a huge deal to worry about it right away, but definitely keep that in mind that you're going to be able to expand and work on a lot of these things that we're going to talk about that take work behind the scenes to get yourself out there, especially if you don't have work yet. Once you're rolling and you got these relationships built, you probably don't have to worry about a lot of that kind of stuff. But um, if you're looking, yeah, we'll have some good tips here for you. So how do you run your business, Sean, as far as uh, your services? We did talk about a little bit in episode one, but mm -hmm. What do you think? What's your setup in like the classic setup of a, a contract climber? Do you think starting out? Yeah, so I think it's it's. I think when most people consider kind of contract climbing, uh, I would propose that the majority of folks are thinking about somebody that comes in to climb and remove the tree. Uh, it is a lot of removals, and mainly because removals typically have a lot involved with them as far as as rigging or various targets that you have to consider stuff like that i mean pruning can certainly get intense uh we've got some massive cottonwoods kind of locally here that pruning a giant limb off that cottonwood is as intense as any removal you're going to do sometimes more intense okay i'm glad you i'm not the only one smash it through. <laughs> well you can't smash it through all the other stuff right you're trying to preserve the rest of the tree um, it's sticking um, straight out like totally 90 degrees over a house and it's huge and you're like well how do i do this yeah exactly. I'm call Sean. it's easy when i can get rid of all this stuff and just kind of like <laughs> swing it that way but totally so pruning can get totally crazy too mm -hmm. um i think the majority of folks that consider contract climbers are are companies that are fairly green um or and what i mean by that is is they may have a ton of experience. Uh, the person that's running the company may have 20, 30, 40 years of climbing experience and be a rock star, um, but the crew they've got on the ground isn't necessarily at that experience level. Okay. And they're typically the folks that are like, hey, I gotta go do the quotes, I gotta do this, I'm over here. Or maybe they've booked multiple jobs, they're just that busy that they need assistance. And so they've got, they're climbing on one site and they've got you kind of leading a crew on another site. Um, so a lot of it is climbing removals. It's predominantly rigging, I would say, uh, from a traditional contract climbing perspective, okay. because you're coming in with your bag of skills and your efficiencies to safely rig out that tree with control. Right. So if uh, if we're thinking ourselves, you know, as contract climbers and we're trying mm -hmm. to sell ourselves, that would be the market. Then the market's going to be tree companies. Uh, that's a good point you made too. Obviously, it could be somebody that's been doing it for a long time and they've kind of lost a luster or they've getting older. They don't want to climb anymore. So they just got a guy doing it sure. for them. They're good at running their business. They've got lots of work coming in. Yep. But like you said before, a lot of the employees are going to be maybe revolving. It's For us, at least, it's seasonal. So it's hard to retain employees for a long time. And if they mm -hmm. are eager, they're generally going to learn and probably move up and they may start their own companies too, which is great. Um, so I guess that's who you want to target. Now, what do you think about like landscaping crews? Because we'll probably get into this a little bit later too, talking about it, but we can talk about it now. Mm -hmm. um, that was an idea I had maybe when you're new, if you're starting out, you could get rid of some of that stress, you know, of having some experienced arborists looking at you and maybe not take on these big, crazy jobs, but maybe there's some lighter jobs uh, doing some removals or pruning for a landscape company that doesn't do trees and they could just bring you in. That might be an, an option, would you, th would you say? Yeah, hundred uh, percent. There's actually there's one main kind of landscape company that I do a lot of work with, uh, and they're predominantly landscape, outdoor construction, and snow removal. That's kind of their mo. Okay. Uh, and so for the spring and summer season, a lot of times they have condo contracts where they're maintaining the lawns, and there's a certain tree aspect that comes with that pruning, clearance, all these types of things. Uh, and so I do work predominantly with one main landscape company to do those services. And it's not a whole lot of climbing. It's not anything super technical or crazy, uh, but it is kind of a nice break every once in a while. And it still keeps me engaged and mentally in the, 
the actual tree care side of things, right? I mean, it's, I think it's pretty easy for folks to kind of fall into this belief that contract climbers are just the, the dude with the chainsaw cutting down the tree. And, and yes, but try and find those avenues that you can still t stay connected with tree care and pruning and, and plant health care and all these other avenues that are so critically important as arborists for us to understand. Uh, and that just happens to be one avenue that I utilize to do that. So I get to prune a lot of ornamental trees. I get to prune, you know, there's condo boards love choke cherries and green ash and all these other trees. So you get you get some cool <laughs> pruning experience and a lot of clearance pruning up over, you know, signs and sidewalks right. and stuff like that. So it's uh, totally not like the super sexy side of massive rigging and the stuff that makes it on Instagram per se, but uh it is still super rewarding and you still get to have that connection with the trees, right? Yeah, and good practice, good reps, good probably experience, yep. you know, finding some work and then dealing with somebody else who's taking on that job and, you know, you're providing them with invoices when you're done and doing all this kind of logistical stuff to get you warmed up, Bingo. maybe with a little less pressure. And there's 100%. so many landscape, in, at least in my opinion, I think there's like more landscaping companies out there and they're so diverse too, um, that you could probably sell yourself to these guys fairly easily if you can get in touch with them. I don't mm -hmm. know if you ever noticed like maybe a little bit of head butting or overlap between landscapers and arborists. I don't know if that's a thing or not. I mean, people, arborists don't want to see landscapers handling trees because they feel like it's their business and, you totally. know, especially if they're doing it wrong. Not to say that there aren't, <laughs> there could be good arborists working for landscape sure. companies, but generally when you're an arborist, yep. you're an arborist. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I get, but I, I like the idea of maybe you being a contract arborist versus a, a contract climber. Think of yourself as that, as that way. Correct. You yep. provide more yep. service beyond just climbing. You know, should get out of that mindset. Yeah. But yeah, how would you? Uh, well, let's get. We'll get to that maybe in a sec here. I was going to say, how would you get to uh, finding those those companies? But sure. So, uh, some hybrid business styles. We talked about a little bit in episode one too, but. Um, there's you working by yourself with your truck and your tools and you just drive to site, show up and, and do your thing. Um, yep. but do you ever, or do you think it's wise to maybe take on more work that includes, uh, maybe it does include some landscaping or it include it's a job that requires, you know, a chipper and different things like that. But because you're the go-to guy, you could be that general contractor, especially with your experience. I guess that's kind of what you would move into in a different way of thinking about it. But then could you hire a, a landscape crew to help you out or hire some other people and then basically you contract them? Yeah, a hundred percent. Uh, and it, it's, I mean, certainly with my sort of environment and, and how things have kind of unfolded for me, it, it kind of does go both ways. Uh, I think probably 80% of my work is contracted for another company. They're providing the equipment as far as chippers and chip trucks and ground crew and those types of things. Uh, and I'm just kind of bringing in my skill set and tools. Right. So they're hiring uh, you to come in. It's yeah. Not so much worry, just easy. Okay. Totally. Yep. There is a, a, I mean, inevitably as tree people, people understand that we're tree people and they have questions and they, Oh, can you deal with this tree? Oh, I'd love to have you come over here. Uh, those conversations happen, right? You're out at some social gathering and somebody mentions, Oh, you were looking for an arbor. Sean's an arborist. And all yeah. of a sudden you're having this conversation about this massive willow in the backyard right. that they want to <laughs> remove or whatever like the case may be. So it's, it's those jobs do come. Uh, personally, I don't necessarily seek them out. If I get a random inquiry, I typically, and we kind of mentioned this in the first episode, I'll typically look at where that inquiry is coming from. And there's typically a company that I do a lot of work with in that local area. And so I can kind of pass them along to them. Okay. Uh, and, and it builds that company, which then makes them real happy and can build our relationship because now they're just going to call me to come help them anyway. So I, I do a lot of that kind of passing work on to create kind of root density for the companies that I work for. Okay. Uh, there are jobs that, you know, for whatever reason, maybe it's an acreage and they're like, hey, we're fairly confident. We've got saws. We can deal with stuff on the ground. We're just like, these things are 100 feet tall and we just are not comfortable getting them down. 
Uh, and so I'll typically partner up with a couple other folks. Uh, there's a couple other contract climbers that I know in the area uh, that I'll partner up with and we'll kind of go and hammer it out and have a big old day of it. And uh, there's certainly some jobs where I'll kind of take point and just kind of run it because I know the person through a connection or something like that. And then I will be the one that contracts the companies that usually contract me and I'll contract them and their chipper and their truck and their ground crew and stuff like that. So it's kind of a reciprocal deal. Right. Um, Do you ever get any kind of tension or anything in there when you're doing that? Like, because they feel like, you know, it should be their job and they contract you usually, but now you're, you're trying to bill them for their time. You know, mm -hmm. I always feel like a bit weird about that sometimes when I do it, but I don't know. Is that a thing? Or like, do you guys have a, a, a referral agreement ever worked out with anyone? I know you said you just do it. It sounds like yeah. just out of the, the good of your hearts and try to build that root density, that relationship, because it's kind of reciprocal. Mm -hmm. But have you explored referrals and those sort of things? Not something that I've necessarily looked into. Uh, it's as far as I'm kind of concerned. I mean, if there's enough work out there for, for everybody, right? And so... It's, it's something we've had a conversation about and, and we kind of mentioned in passing in the first episode, but this concept of collaboration over competition. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's something that I've believed in for a long time and mainly because everybody's got their unique skill set within our Bora culture. Uh, you know, somebody may be super, super, super adept at, at pruning or somebody might be super adept at determining disease and insect kind of issues and, and how to mitigate those. Somebody might be super adept at like crazy elaborate rigging situations. So it's, it's finding those ways that we can kind of work together. And so typically if I'm taking the lead on a job and I'm contracting other folks in, it's a fairly involved job. It's not your simple, you know, climb, throw the top out of a tree and piece it down firewood size. Yeah, it's, it's like, like an acreage and it's it's totally. pruning a whole row of multiple poplars or 100%, multiple yep. snag removals or something. Yeah, a lot of crane stuff I end up kind of taking okay. the lead on. So if somebody reaches out and they've got this tree and it's like, hey, we're going to need a crane to deal with this. Uh, I've got contacts through various kind of channels within the crane industry. So I can typically get a pretty good rate on a crane, which is better for the customer. It's better for everybody. Uh, and as long as I'm bringing those folks in and paying, you know, a wage that they can pay their crew, they can pay for the, the use of the equipment and the maintenance and all these types of things. It's generally, it works out pretty well for people. Um, but I typically won't take the lead. If it's if it's a job that those folks can handle, then I typically just pass it along. Uh, but if it's super crazy elaborate, then sometimes it just kind of makes sense for me to kind of run point on it. Okay. Yeah. And the crane thing's interesting, which we actually didn't touch on much in episode one, which we could no. have, but that's another thing that comes up with contract climbers is you may often find use in a crane over mm -hmm. doing something much more difficult um, or impossible without a crane. So that's nice if you have that relationship built up. So I guess even if you're being subcontracted, then as a contract climber, do you include like the crane under you? Like, so you hire the crane, but then you just increase your, your rate based on it's you with a crane. Or does the principal contractor arborist pay the crane? Yeah, typically the principal contractor will will pay for the crane and okay, the person that comes with it. it. I just arrange it because nice. I get a pretty decent deal and I can kind of pass that along to the the principal contractor. So gotcha. uh, it works out pretty good that way. So so we keep it simple. So it sounds like I guess it depends on what you want out of this business. Is like mm -hmm. and it sounds like what you like is you like some of that simplicity, probably because you're doing so many other things that you don't have the time to be doing all this stuff Bingo. behind the scenes. Because when you run a business, uh, I don't know if pe everyone realizes how much work it actually is behind the scenes, organizing and emailing people back and forth and booking them and then dealing with when they cancel and just like, it's nonstop. But if you're a contract climber, it's like you can kind of show up, do your thing, peace out, no stress. Well, not no stress, but you know, less of that kind of thing. Totally. Yeah. But people yeah. could, if they wanted, and you have that experience as well to be that principal contractor and almost get more experience sort of general contracting on these jobs that maybe start out as some sort of tree work. And you could take that and expand into all sorts of things. Really. Once you get into that mindset of like, okay, I can just organize subcontractors to come help me do this job. Cause even I get this, you show up and it's like, Oh, Hey, do you, 
can you do this over here too? Or can you, you know, people ask you like doing patios and all sorts of rent. You're like, no, I'm an art. Do you even know what an arborist is? <laughs> like, but it's, Oh, you're, you just work outside the yard. Yeah. You're like, a, you're like a do everything outside my house. Right. So totally. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. I could just refer somebody else and, and get, maybe get work out a kickback with them. If you build their relationship, uh, which I've done in Cochrane a little bit, mm -hmm. It's kind of difficult to keep track of. Again, that's like a bunch of work too. So it is kind of nice just to refer people off and then let them take care of it as opposed to you making all those connections and emailing and getting it going. But um, but you could literally hire these people and have them come in and do the job and just be a general contractor arborist too. Sure. Yeah. Yep. And there's, there's I'm sure that that exists out there, frankly. Is there a lot of money uh, doing the contract, like general contracting, do you think? or? <laughs> There, there can be. Uh, I, I, I mean, I've been out of touch with, you know, that side of things. I mean, sure, you can talk about general contracting from an arboriculture side, uh, but I've been out of touch from the construction side that I used to be involved in for so many years now. I, I've kind of lost touch with where certain profit margins are and stuff like that. Yeah, because that's what uh, I was going to ask you. Is, like, yeah. How do you know how much more? So obviously we're not that experienced in this, but... Mm -hmm. you'd have to inflate those costs. So if someone's going to cost a hundred bucks an hour to have on site to do their job, like how much more are you going to charge on Bingo. top of that? Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> so, it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting situation too. Cause I mean, it's, it's, we have so much access to information now and homeowners have so much access to information through the internet, through YouTube, through all of these other avenues that they can gain knowledge. And so I would I would hazard to guess, and I'm sure there's some construction folks, I don't know if they're listening to this or not, but they'll probably be like, hey, that's not true. But to me, I just feel like they're, the homeowner in today's day and age is at a, a point and an, an ability to educate themselves that they're typically kind of running that role themselves. They're the yeah. ones kind of laying out the timelines. They're the ones dealing directly with the various trades, etc. So I, I think, I don't yeah. know. I mean, I, I think kind of being the general guy that just kind of moves and shakes and lines some folks up in, in our boric culture, I think it'd be a tough go uh, without you actually having some hands-on or some other value set that you bring other than just coordination, right? Yeah, yeah. I definitely uh, had some struggles with that with Cochrane Tree Care because I was basically a, a solo arborist as well when it was happening. Yep. Not working for other companies, but then there was a larger landscape company that was pretty established here in the beginning. So it was kind of attractive for me to try and get more work. And uh, what they wanted to do was obviously have their clients that were in this in the Bears Paw area here. You're familiar with, uh, you know, big mm -hmm. acreages just outside of Calgary. So these kind of fancy homes, that sort of thing. Um, where these people didn't want to do that. They just wanted the ease of like, I hire one guy, I talk to one person, I just pay the bill. I don't mm -hmm. care, which I personally don't like because I, I want to connect with the customers and the clients and have them appreciate what I'm doing. Like, I don't like just showing up and being treated like, you know, slave boy out there, <laughs> just cutting everything, you know, and then see totally. you later. Yep. So for me running my business, I didn't want to work under this other company because they would hire or they would get hired by the client and they would do all the landscaping, you know, pulling out shrubs, planting shrubs, planning and everything. And then they wanted to kind of bring me on as like their tree guy. And then they were sort of advertising that they had tree services, but it was just me right. doing it for them subcontracting. And it was kind of like, go here and do this job. And then I sort of find out later on that I'm showing up and I'm trying to connect with the, the customers and not always getting to, or they're, they're kind of treating me differently, like as if I'm not hired by them. So I didn't like that. And then I find out mm -hmm. that they're charging like exorbitant amounts beyond what I'm charging to do that work that's isolated. And I was like, I don't like this because they do see my truck and my name and my business there on site and associate the totally. direct cost to me and think I'm charging them double what I normally would. And I was like, no. So I kind of cut ties with that, mm -hmm. but some people may like that. They may not want, like you said before, um, they maybe, or we had talked about being more introvert, not wanting to talk to people. And it's just, they can still run a business, but they can distance themselves from the customers. They can rely upon a principal contractor. Like my brother, for example, up in Edmonton, he's a, con he's a construction guy. He does sort yep. of one job, decks and siding and 
he's worked for the same guy forever and then started his own business and then he just still works for him but it's own, his own business but he doesn't have to look sure. after him yeah so yep. yeah and i think it's 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 kind of an interesting situation and and certainly i mean i had experience sort of managing a tree care company i didn't necessarily own the company myself um, but the the gentleman that owned it was very involved in other avenues of employment up in the oil sands and up in you know northern alberta sort of thing uh, and so for vast periods of time i was the one that was managing the crews and booking the jobs and speaking to the clients and quoting and invoicing and doing all of this stuff that is typically the responsibility of the owner or the sales arborist if you will um and so i've had that kind of exposure uh and that was previous to me kind of branching out and doing my own contract arborist sort of stuff uh and it's interesting because the biggest thing that i was worried about missing out on was that connection with the customer was that end user connection with the homeowner with the the tree owner and and being able to have those conversations and both educate and learn from them and i mean we've I've walked up to trees that, you know, a company may have walked in and said, hey, this dead tree needs to come down. They hire you to come in and you just start cutting. And then once you get that connection with the homeowner, you start to find out there's sentimental attachment to it. Well, maybe the reason it's coming down is there's a risky limb. Maybe we can cable that. Uh, and so for me, I've found that I seek out other contractors or, or people kind of primary contractors that would hire me i seek out those that are interested in collaboration and that are interested in still allowing me mm -hmm. the opportunity to educate and have that connection with the homeowner yeah and i'm not handing them my business card i'm just they understand that the homeowner at the end of the day is going to get a better experience as a whole it's still that company's name on the invoice on everything else. Uh, and they're going to get that word of mouth recommendation and those reviews that you and I both know matter so much in this industry. Yeah. And so the biggest thing I can say to, to those types of things, especially if you're interested in going down the contract climbing Avenue, uh, you can certainly quit a contractor. You know, they might decide that they don't want to work with you, but you can certainly decide that you don't want to work with them. Maybe they don't fit your values and your yep. and your belief system, or they're not offering you kind of the avenue that you want to go. And I've been very lucky that I mean, there are very few companies that I end up going and working a day or two with where I'm like, yeah, you know what? Probably wouldn't accept that one again. Uh, I've been very lucky in that most of the companies that I've had the opportunity to collaborate with are very like-minded people and want to give those opportunities to connect and learn and educate and all these things we've talked about. So I can certainly, you know, understand where an environment like what you're speaking of with this landscape company, where it's, it's, it's definitely a difficult environment. If that's who you are as a person is the person that likes to educate and connect with the homeowners. It can, it can be a difficult Avenue. Um, if yeah. you don't kind of steer the ship early on in the right direction. Yeah, especially if you have that entrepreneur mindset too. You're mm -hmm. trying to build something and create your own brand and everything. So you want to be in control and you want to make be making those decisions. And you also feel responsible for what you're doing. So I ran into yep. so many problems with miscommunication because they'd be like, oh, you're going to go there and prune all of these stuff in their yard. And you get there and they're not home, you know, whatever. They're snowbirds and they're down south. And it's like, okay, well, how do they want this pruned? Like, do they want this? Cl Normally I'd knock on the door and be like, go through everything with them. You totally. know, I, when I do a quote and then I'd knock on the door when I show up, we do another review, walk around, make sure we're on the same page. Because man, when you, when you cut the wrong thing on someone's tree and you can't put it back, people are pissed. And then totally. some people almost look for those opportunities, you know, these kinds of people as a way to kind of get out of paying or something, because they know if there's something happened that they didn't agree with. And it's like, you know, so... You got to be so upfront and so clear with everything. I feel like, yep. To, if you're representing your business, uh, to make that right. But yeah. anyway, yeah. yeah. So we kind of mentioned in the first episode too about um, that pre-job meeting, right? As part of kind of the the day to day from a contract style, um, making sure you have those conversations early on and and establish the scope of work uh, to kind of build on your point, especially with pruning. I've had numerous companies call up and say hey we need this tree pruned i'm like okay what's the target what is the goal here what are we yeah. pruning for 
And it's just like, oh, that just, it just needs to be pruned. And I'm like, okay, so we need to go have a conversation with the homeowner. I'm happy to come in and have that conversation alongside you, but we need to understand what we're doing here. Right. Because exactly what you say, you stroll in and you prune it in a way that they homeowner wasn't necessarily anticipating and you can't put that stuff back. Yeah. So it's, it's as important as the pre job kind of scope meeting is between you and a potential primary contractor that's employing you or, or contracting you in. It's also important to have those conversations with the homeowner and find companies that allow you to ask those questions and get involved is all I can kind of offer for that. So, yeah. And I feel like we are kind of straying a little bit away from the general simplistic contract climbing arborist that's generally <laughs> totally. doing removals. You know, so <laughs> well, we went like, <laughs> yeah, we went into like this, you know, hole of like, okay, we're thinking beyond that now, which is sorry, everyone. It's hard for us because uh, we've kind of navigated our way through that into our own niches. But that's, I guess that gives you a good example of opportunities and things you can do as you get going. It doesn't have to be a, a straightforward show up, remove tree, leave, but it can be, or it can be there mm -hmm. until you're comfortable and maybe you want to earn more money or you want to you want to get some different experiences and things going so these yeah, opportunities sure. are available yep. to you and you know one other thing that I do too I I mentioned I didn't like working for uh, other like say landscape companies or bigger companies that hired me for, th for those reasons that I mentioned but um, when I come across jobs that are too difficult even though I'm mostly solo I subcontract other people too like some guys in town that they have a bucket truck like because I don't have a bucket truck and there's two guys, they're both experienced and uh, they have a chipper. So that's some major things that I need. So when I come across these big jobs, I don't have to throw them away. I usually still lead them and instead of giving them away to those guys because their truck is so big and looks like a big billboard too, you know, got to keep them out of town. <laughs> yeah, to totally, <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, you know, so I try and find a good parking spot before they get there, but yeah, no, uh, I bring them in and they help and they, they give me their rates and whatever it is, it's not a big deal. It's you know, we charge a little bit extra for looking after, you know, because you were the lead person and it's worth something that you attracted that customer and you have to do all the mm -hmm. legwork and behind the scenes and you have the insurance and things like that. So, and yep. the WCB, yep. it falls on you as the principal contractor and stuff as well. So it is important to uh, inflate a little bit beyond what you're, they're charging you um, 100%. to have them yeah. around, but it gives me more opportunity to do some bigger jobs and to work with other people, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. Um, while we're talking about that insurance, WCB, uh, do you have WCB? Do you, I, I have know a you relationship don't, yeah, with WCB. Yeah, I know you don't need to, and I yeah. don't need to make it seem negative, but that's the problem sometimes is people think it's a negative thing if you don't have it, but you don't actually need it. Yeah, well, then it's, it's I mean, this is probably going to be fairly Alberta specific. Uh, I, yeah. I'm not. So we'll keep it the general. expert in yeah in WCB across the provinces or in other kind of areas of of jurisdiction. WCB means, from an Alberta perspective. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say WCB for us is uh, the Workers Compensation Board. So it's Thank for you. basically when you get injured on the job, um, you're covered and you're not going to be left without earning some sort of money. So you pay this premium to WCB, and then they'll pay you if you get hurt. But if you work for a principal contractor as a contract climbing arborist and you're a, say a sole proprietor, you may not need that kind of coverage because the principal contractor usually has it and that has to cover you. So I have WCB now for Cochrane Tree Care because I need it for my employees if mm -hmm. they get hurt on the job, but I don't actually yep. cover myself uh, with WCB, more for personal reasons, but. <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of interesting. So from an Alberta perspective, WCB doesn't necessarily provide the business owner with coverage. It's there for the employees, which is exactly what you're saying. So companies that have employees that work for them, they build this, this relationship with WCB so that if one of their employees gets injured while working for them, their wage is covered, you know, they can go and seek the medical care that they need, the rehab, etc. Uh, from a business owner perspective, it doesn't typically cover you. And so as a sole proprietor or, you know, the solo owner of an incorporated business, you get WCB, but it doesn't actually cover you and I don't have any employees. So what's the purpose? Mm -hmm. And so what you can get as a sole proprietor or as a business owner is you can get personal coverage through WCB. Yeah. And so essentially, like if essentially. I were to, exactly. If I were to get injured, they'd pay my wage. Now, 
to there's a degree. life insurance and disability insurance policies that are available out there that f are far superior to that offering yeah. that I have. So for me, I do have a WCB number. I have a relationship with WCB. I have a small amount of personal coverage just to build that relationship and have that that certificate because there are right. companies out there that do want to see it as part yes. of that. Hey, we'd like to bring you in as a contractor, but we would like to see your WCB clearance or your yep. letter of clearance. And, and there so can be I some misunderstanding. Sometimes people are misunderstood yep. and they just assume, you know, you have to have WCB. Or yes. yeah. Or so you could lose jobs, literally, just based on perception. Or some clients reach out and they're like, do you have WCB? And I'd be like, no, I don't, blah, blah, blah. And it's all I hear is that, they're, no, don't want you. So it yeah, could be exactly. worth getting WCB just to appease these people that think that you need it. And mm -hmm. it, it does have its benefit, of course, too. So everyone has to do their own research on whether they need some sort of coverage like this. Um, but also, if you work for different corporations, uh, like condo complexes or communities and that sort of thing, they require you to have all of these things, insurance exactly. or whatever. And so then, and that's a policy requirement that that companies own. have, larger companies have. It might be written into their health and safety manual. It might be part of their, you know, core auditing or something like that. Uh, it might just be written down in the the association bylaws for the condo board that any contractor coming on site has to have WCB. Yeah. And so whatever the actual reason behind it is, it's I. I do have that relationship. I do encourage building that relationship. If you want to get into the contract climbing scene, certainly look at other avenues of life and disability insurance uh, that are available to you because we've talked about this. This is an incredibly dangerous thing that we do. Yeah. Um, but I do encourage to at least build that relationship, whatever that looks like in your jurisdiction, so that you do have that paperwork and that documentation you can provide to help pave the way to some more jobs, right? Yeah, for sure. And then just as a, a recap summary of WCB, there there is benefit to it. Um, and the purpose of it is again, if you get hurt on the job, say you hurt your back, you're gonna need compensation to cover what your normal wage was, if you pay yourself on payroll, whatever, for the duration of time you're off. And it's usually it's usually capped or it's a percentage of what your wage was, so it might, it might be slightly reduced. But there's mm -hmm. also often costs with rehabilitation and then they look after your case. So if you need rehabilitation um, for your back, they can provide you with these therapists and physio, usually through their own programs locally. Um, and they'll hook you up and set you up, make sure you're taken care of. Uh, you'll go through the program, get reassessed by them and make sure you're fit to go back to work before you do. And it's all kind of properly documented, all this kind of stuff. So that's the idea with WCB, I think it's in that case, more beneficial for large corporations, companies, municipalities that have a lot of employees that are doing that sort of thing. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, I got to be careful what I say here, but as if you're, if you're an employee, <laughs> certainly have that conversation with your employer about WCB uh, and total complete and total side note. Uh, I've, I've gone through several WCB claims as an employee for other companies that Me too. I have been injured on the job. <laughs> uh, probably 15, 12, 15 years ago, I had a pretty catastrophic leg injury that required oh some pretty severe surgery. Uh, had, had I gone through a regular, you know, public health care for those not in Canada, yes, we have public health care. Uh, for if I had gone through that regular public health care process, it would have been two to three years wait to get to that surgery. Whereas WCB, it was a private clinic. I was in and out within a month. Uh, they pay for all the rehab and all those types of things. So it, right. they, there is a ton of value in WCB for employees. If you are the owner of a company with employees, or if you are an employee of a company, have those conversations because there's a ton of value in it for sure. Okay. So WCB or something similar probably exists in your area, whether you're from Canada yeah. or from the US that's gonna incorporate this sort of coverage if you get hurt on the job. Okay, um, you also mentioned that alternatives to that could be something like life insurance or other plans that you could go through your regular insurance company. Just ask questions of what you can do for coverage. They may be yes. yeah. they may be less costly. They may be able to integrate with your own personal life insurance, whatever it might be. You're just, it's just something to know that you have to explore these things or consider them before you start up a business is what yep. we're trying to get at. Um, what about insurance? I think insurance is mandatory if you're going to have a business. 
It is. Yeah, it is mandatory. Uh, personally, and, and this is a conversation that you may, you know, if you're starting out as a contract climber and you're starting to have these conversations with potential uh, kind of primary contractors that want to bring you in, it might be part of the conversation to have um, with me as soon as I take possession, if you will, of the tree and I'm the one calling the shots and calling the rigging scenario and doing whatever cuts that need to happen, uh, that's on me. Okay. So Even if, if you're if, the... You're not the principal contractor. It's still your insurance. 100%. If you're the yep. okay, yeah, that's on me. That's good to know. So if and that's that is another kind of appealing side, if you will, to some of these folks that do bring in contract climbers or contract arborists. Mm. Is at this point, it's like this tree is pretty crazy, but I know this guy and I know he's got the skill set. But yeah, the liability. Well, now it's on him, right? Right. And think about and so cost for like say the landscaping company that's just doing snow removal, bingo. cutting grass. Their insurance yep. is probably pretty low. Yep. Because you pay more insurance for tree more tree removal or yeah. tree pruning or anything like that. And we're not talking yeah. a really personal injury with this kind of insurance. This is more like insurance if you smash the glass roof Correct. on the uh, ranch house that we're going to go and do together here in <laughs> April. Exactly. Exactly. Your speed line wasn't quite taut enough and you smash the gazebo or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Uh, you know, you hit the fence. Damage. You just weren't damages. paying attention. Damages. Exactly. And so it's, it's once I come on site and I take possession of the tree and I'm in the tree and I'm kind of leading the crew and calling the shots, uh, that's on my insurance. Okay. So I carry fairly robust insurance for that purpose. I've never had to use it. Knock on wood, fingers crossed. I don't yeah. ever have to, but I do have it. Uh, and it is a big piece of that conversation with potential companies that would like to hire me is yes, I come with insurance. These are the insurance parameters I have and I lay that all out for them. Yeah. It's another reason why I bring my own equipment as well because I know the history of it and I know the inspection protocols it's been through and I know, you know, we talk cycles to failure and all these other gear nerd things that we can get into. I know all of the history, so I'm confident in my gear. Whereas that block and sling I don't know its history. It might have been sitting in a puddle of gas in the back of the chip truck for who knows how long. It may have been cycled to above its working load limit multiple times and has weakened every time. Uh, I just don't know the history of it. Yeah. That's a big reason why I bring my own gear. I'm coming. It's on my insurance. I want to make sure that my tools are my own. They're sharp. They're ready to go. My equipment is in good working order, etc. Right. And a lot of that stuff's going to come up, um, maybe not just or through insurance, but like OHS or whatever. If if somebody gets yep. hurt or something happens and there has to be some sort of investigation, because they all want to cover their butts and nobody wants to pay any money, um, ultimately. So they're going to look into it and find loopholes. And if it's like, oh, you weren't using your own gear and you knew this wasn't proper setup or whatever it might be, you're not following mm -hmm. certain guidelines, ANSI guidelines, that kind of stuff. Then uh, you could be liable. You may, your insurance may not cover that kind of thing. And that could 100%. put you out of business, yep. could make you bankrupt. Who knows what could happen? So. Definitely when you look into insurance, uh, understand what it covers because you can probably give them a range of, of duties. And I know when I started out, yes. I, I said, I'm only doing this and this and this to try and get cheap insurance and whatever was my mindset. Um, and it was also difficult to yeah. find insurance because a lot of people don't understand what arborists are and they do and they kind of loop you under landscaping or something like that, you know, depending on who they are. But then as time went on and I was doing more work I had talked to my insurance again and realized I looked, I'm like, oh, I'm not even covered for like half the stuff I do anymore. Like I, I'm doing more things. I have more people or it's more dangerous, like whatever it might be. I have more equipment. So you have to update your insurance with that. Otherwise you're not going to be covered and you can continue on working day to day. But I mean, mm -hmm. if something happens, it's the whole point of insurance, then um, you might not be covered. Yeah. Well, it's kind of an interesting point as well that you just made with regards to you know, the cheapest option and stuff like that. And, and there are a ton of insurance companies that just do not understand what this is, what the dangers are and what the risks are. Uh, and so you'll start to have these conversations and all of a sudden an insurance company gives you some quote that's like, that's it? Like, that seems yeah, really, I had that. yeah, this is awesome. And the only stipulation um, for me was like, you're, you're not allowed to operate a crane. And I was like, oh, yeah, of course not. Don't worry, I won't operate a crane. <laughs> yeah, I won't like, be the you guy have to be a the crane controls. operator. Got it. Like, sounds like you have no idea what I'm doing at my job. Exactly. But I'll take your exactly. cheap insurance. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's. 
I I would I would push folks not to just accept the cheapest one. I would I would have the conversations. There are insurance companies out there that do have a very good understanding of what it is that we do for work. Uh, specifically, the insurance company that I've been using, I had a conversation with them, and it was like, you know, what exactly are we doing? Are we doing residential removals, residential pruning? Are you doing commercial work around? Pot? Like they knew all the lingo, they knew all the different terminology, mm. and and I certainly felt very comfortable in getting insurance through these folks because they have they the knowledge and understanding yeah. of what we do. So, And if you don't know, maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, poke around to other guys in the industry, maybe in your area yep. and ask them. Like, I'm sure this, again, it goes back to the first uh, sort of episode, but like finding a mentor, a mentor can help you with this kind of stuff for sure. And maybe recommend 100%. like Johnny helped me find a good accountant. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, that sort of thing. So it'll definitely make the the road a lot easier for you if you can if you can just ask somebody. And we obviously can't give advice for people internationally of where they need to find this kind of stuff. Um, what about other stuff? That, you know, in your truck, you carry anything else, uh, or maybe digitally? Because when I started a business, there was no one that, that came to me and said, "Hey, here's all the things you need to have." It was like I was sitting in landscape horticulture class one day, and they're talking about OH and S and all these things you had to have, and I'm like. Uh, I know what OH and S stands for, but I didn't know I needed to have a book like in my truck and totally all yeah. these things in place. Especially as soon as you get an employee, then it's different. They need to have more things in place written down, like safety protocols or MSDS sheets for any mm -hmm. kind of chemicals you might have. And I'm not saying I'm perfect and have all these things in place, but it's something to probably consider and look into. Do you? Yeah, 100%. Do you, know what kind of things we're supposed to have in there like i think i've, I've even heard like fire extinguisher is you're supposed to have in your truck yeah yeah i mean it's it's <laughs> i don't have a fire extinguisher I'm I, yeah i mean i i i won't sit here and necessarily pretend to understand the the legislative requirements uh i personally just kind of I check all the boxes, whether or not it's an actual legislative requirement that you are you need to have with you or not I do it anyway, um, and mainly because it's part of my business model is being incredibly self-sufficient, but also providing that leadership and that mentorship to the crew. Right. So what kind of things so do have, you have? I have a fire extinguisher mounted in the back of my truck. Do you? Uh, it, oh, yeah. You're, you're the right guy for this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I've got the fire extinguisher <laughs> mounted in the back of the truck. Uh, I've got a general first aid kit mounted in the back of my truck that's kind of just for the general emergencies. Yeah. Um, I also come with... Uh, I come with like aerial trauma kits. I come with, I mean, I got sea collars in my truck. I've got all yeah. of the stuff and, and I'm, I, I fully admit that I am the nerd when it comes to this kind of stuff. But to me, I, I never want to have a situation on a job site where there's confusion, there's chaos and there's panic. So if there's going to be an incident, if something is going to happen, and I specifically say incident because there's no accidents in this industry, it is a highly complex system, it builds, right? So if there is an incident that happens on site, I want to make sure that I have the equipment to deal with it. I want to make sure that the folks I'm working with at least understand what their role is going to be. So I have full safety paperwork in my truck. Uh, if the employer that I'm working for, if the primary contractor has their own site hazard assessment, their own safety paperwork, and it's like it's good paperwork, then we'll deal with that. That's fine. Uh, but in that absence, and it has actually secured me more work, is because I roll up and I'm like, oh, have you got site paperwork? You're like, no, we don't have site paperwork. It's not something we really do. Oh, can I show you this form that I use? Uh, and I've sent the form to people and they've started using it. Uh, and I've had folks that have just like, you know what? Every time we're doing something so, somewhat technical, we're bringing you in because of the way you go through this form and you kind of, you know, have the, the safety briefing with, with the crews. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in episode three. But uh, I come pretty much loaded to bear. I've got the fire extinguishers. I've got the medical stuff. I've got my personal equipment. I've got all the safety paperwork. I've yep. got copies of the green log weight chart for everybody on the crew. I've got little <laughs> laminated copies, like five or six of them that people can stick in their pocket for the day. Like I've got yep. all sorts of stuff that um, that I bring with me. So. And I mean, it, if you were to ever be, you know, investigating, we're, we're always in fear of this investigation of what's going to happen mm. when something goes wrong. But if something like that were to ever go down and people see that you have all these things in place 
and you're clearly making an effort to be have things written down and documented you're going to be pretty well off. You're probably not going to sink. If you, and if you find a few things that you may have missed, it's like, well, clearly your intention was not to, but if they show up and they're like, okay, so who's in charge here? Don't know who's in charge. Where's your pre-work safety checklists and safety meeting minutes you did with everybody. <clears throat> you're like, what? Don't have those. Okay. Bingo. So let's start. And then they start digging deeper. It's like you're getting audited. And then one thing leads to another and realize you have no clue about these things or you don't have any of them. Then it's like, okay, shit's hitting the fan here. <laughs> things are totally, not going to go 100%. well. So it's, it's good to uh, pay attention to these kinds of things and realize that this is going to take a bit of work and it's not really the sexy side of a war culture, but needs to happen. And it, it gives you, I think, um, a good mindset and intention before you start working to give you that preparedness uh, mm -hmm. to make sure things are going to be safe and you're going to do things professionally. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, how we do anything is how we do everything, right? And so if you're if you're taking the shortcuts and you're not necessarily, ah, you know what, I don't need to worry about that piece of kit or, ah, the safety paperwork, we, we can skip it today. If you're taking those shortcuts in the pre-job stuff or the pre-job equipment sort of uh, aspect, once it comes time, you're up in the tree, you're doing the rigging, those trends and tendencies catch up with you. And, and you start to become complacent or you start to take shortcuts in the tree. And this is what I mean by incidents and complex systems yeah. that build, right? It's not like a, all of a sudden, oh my goodness, everything was absolutely perfect. There's always something that's happened. There's that thought in the mind of, ah, maybe I'll just take this a little bigger or whatever. Yeah. Um, they build on each other. And yeah. so right off the hop, make sure you've got your, your ducks in a row and your paperwork crossed, your T's dotted, all those types of things, uh, because that is preventing that building towards potentially an incident. So yeah, and if you don't know what you need, because if I were to sit down and tell you exactly what you need right now, I couldn't do it. But I would say, mm -hmm. as far as finding a resource, again, beyond finding a mentor, maybe find some sort of organization that has these tools to help you. So I know at least Bingo. I've come across a, a variety of, you know, small business, um, you know, even sponsored by the government or whatever they are in your community to have all these resources there and you can tell them what kind of business you have and they'd be able to tell you all these things that you should have in place. Yep. Um, so just start Googling or researching those kinds of resources. Um, even Aboriculture Canada, the school that Sean and I assistant and struck with, they're, they may have some knowledge around that kind of things, of things that you would need. At least when you go through courses, you could ask instructors, but I know, shout out to them, mm -hmm. they, well, they allow you to use like their safety sheets and their checklist and they want you to and they're like take them yeah you can take our name off put your own name on uh whatever because they want everybody to be safe and people don't know where to find these resources and they're specifically made for arborists on site doing these yeah doing these jobs so that's another option too for people is look into your training school or whatever 100 percent. yep yep for sure and a lot of the Arboriculture Canada instructors are business owners and have gone through this exact same conversation. What do I need to have? Yeah. What requirements are there? Uh, and so they're huge resources. Yeah. So, you know, reach out, get involved, find some instructors in your area, or just reach out through the website and get involved in some of the open enrollment, right? Start building those connections and having those conversations. So, Can you give us, <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot here with some of the stuff, but... Can you give us a bit of a breakdown? We can hash it out together maybe as far as how do you make yourself official? You know, you're, you're just Sean, the dad. Now you want to be Sean, the arborist, you mm -hmm. know, the specialist Sterna out there, start your business. Do you be a, there's a, you could be a sole proprietor or you could be an yep. incorporated business or there are more partnerships if you're starting with somebody else, but we won't talk about those. Yep. Um, yeah. Yep. So what does that mean to yeah. you? Or what are you? So are you incorporated? In between at the moment. Um, so, <laughs> well, and so, okay, so there's there's a story here. So okay. the difference, and again, this is going to be kind of specific to Alberta. I'm not you the expert on how this is going to work. No, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good conversation to have because there's, there's benefits, there's, there's pros and cons to going both as my own self, as my independent kind of contract arborist side of things. Yeah. Um, as a sole proprietor, Sole proprietorship is very easy. Uh, when it comes tax time, I just submit my own personal taxes <laughs> with the you know piece of the tax puzzle that says that I make income as a sole proprietor. And there's some deductions that happen through there and, and you still go through that kind of business Excuse accounting me. sort of thing. 
but it's it's very simple. It's it's far more simple from that regard, um, from a tax perspective and from just pure simplicity of of operation, if you will. Where you can get into a little bit of issue, and this is my push uh, lately to kind of incorporate. When I incorporate, I'm still going to be one. But now it's the corporation and they pay me a salary. So I'm not necessarily the only guy. Now there's a corporation that pays me a salary. So from a business accounting perspective, I now have to file taxes for the business and I have to file my own personal taxes. They're now completely separate. Um, so a little bit more work from that regard. But where you kind of get the benefit of incorporating is now your insurance is the corporation. Your name isn't on the insurance. You're not tied personally to that insurance policy. And so as a sole proprietor, right. you can you can find insurance policies that will give you that protection, but it's very difficult because inevitably when I put my company name on the insurance, that doesn't necessarily exist. I have a business number and I have a trade name, but that doesn't necessarily like that's not an entity. That's not a corporation. Yeah, like if you're a like, sole proprietor, it's you. It's like I'm Sean. Exactly, I'm the business. So exactly. you're personally liable. You're exactly. the personally the one that they're going to go after for more money when you, you Bingo. know, drop a branch on their house and this yeah. investigation and when happens. When my business and... account can't cover it, now they're coming after the personal side. Yeah. Uh, and so, like Which I said, be I've dangerous. I've been incredibly lucky in that the relationship I have with my insurance provider. I mean, I've had these conversations. And I, I have protection for that, um, but that is something that can be a bit of a detriment from a sole proprietor standpoint. Uh, right. And so incorporating is, it does bring some more complications as far as taxes go and those types of things, but it can help protect you personally from certain liabilities. Right. And an incorporation is like creating a separate identity. So it's an entity. So it's uh, it's its own standalone imaginary thing not mm -hmm. imaginary but you know what i mean yeah um, yes that you said has the insurance and and everything and then it also pays for all of these expenses as well and then other benefits to include uh being taxed at different rates mm -hmm. so yep. the tax percentages of what your income is because it's not your income it's the it's the company's income when you're incorporated um it's taxed a lot less there's all sorts of different options there and then when you buy some equipment for example um, or you have equipment, but then you transfer it, say, to the uh, incorporation. You're selling it to the company now, so then the company owes you money tax-free. There's all sorts of little benefits. This is why you need to find a decent accountant. Well, 100%. You, and you have to have an accountant when you're incorporated too, which we didn't mention. So you have to do corporate filing taxes, yep. which could be maybe a couple thousand bucks, whereas a sole proprietor, you're doing everything again because you're independent. It's a, it's a personal tax return. You're just saying, I got yep, all this money exactly. from these places. It could be more work, but then you're paying personal tax on everything you earn, which is taxed at a higher amount as well. Yeah, the other benefit about sole proprietor though is you do get to write off all of your tools and stuff that you purchase to do to deliver that work. Um, so your inevitably, income. correct, yeah. So inevitably at the end of the at the year come tax season, it's, it's pretty, there can be some pretty lucrative um, benefits to being a sole proprietor if you're in an environment where insurance isn't necessarily an issue. Um, to me, to me, that's the big kicker. I mean, yes, there's all sorts of other benefits with regards to, you know, what you're mentioning as far as business taxes and all these things go. Um, for me, I've had a relationship with my insurance company where I, I haven't had to worry about potential personal ties within some sort of claim. Um, that's usually not the case. And what I will say is it's probably changing. And without getting too much into the weeds, that is a big part of my motivation at this point. Uh, like I'm going through that process right now to incorporate because of those insurance considerations that have kind of come up. So, Okay. Yeah, so it's something to consider. Maybe you don't have to do it right away. I think a lot of people, just because it's simple, like you can go out yep. today and go prune someone's tree. You're automatically a sole proprietor. Mm -hmm. It's your responsibility to claim that income as tax and whatever you're your shot and if you want to have a name you can you can do that as well so that's a little bit different getting a trade name you'd go down to your yep. registries and you could register the name rocky mountain arborist and then with that trade name so you you pay for that registration it goes into a a list they do a nuanced search 
and uh, make sure there's nobody else called Rocky Mountain Arborist or something similar in the area, which doesn't really protect them or you, but kind of gives you that heads up that, as far as I know, you shouldn't maybe register this name because it's so close to somebody else's. Um, and then you could take that name that you registered with and go to the bank, and then you could open up a, you know, a business bank account with this trade name. Mm -hmm. Of course, you got to pay them money now for that as well. <laughs> but at yep. least now you look a bit more professional, as, if that's a concern to you. So if you're, you know, dealing with clients directly, uh, and you want to charge them, at least you're on your invoices and everything. It can say Rocky Mountain Arborist, and they can, you know, yep. Rocky Mountain Arborist. They can e-transfer you to a unique email address as well attached to that, that sort of thing. Correct. Yep. Yep. And you can do that regardless of sole proprietor or incorporation. Yeah. It's, it's, it can you go see that trade way, name, so. I guess. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool. There's probably lots of other uh, benefits and drawbacks to both, but uh, we're not, you know, tax people, accountant people. No, so. we're not. We're not tax people and I'm not experts in business law or and I'm certainly no <laughs> I'm certainly in no position to provide you business advice. Yeah, <laughs> I can I, merely speak from my experience and kind of yeah. the path that I've gone down. So. Yeah, I just give you a heads up if you don't know, at least, you know, you are a sole proprietor if you're starting out right away, yeah. but you can, yep. you can incorporate the insurance and all that kind of stuff as a sole proprietor too. So you can do that, um, versus incorporating, but uh, you have to be incorporated to have employees and that sort of thing too, or to set yep. up health spending accounts or things like that too. There's all sorts of different benefits. So it depends on where you are for growth. Um, I think a general rule of thumb, um, cause we can talk about GST is that once you get, at least here in Canada, once you get over $30,000 income, then you have to start paying or charging for GST. So if you think you're going to make more than that right away, uh, it could be a good idea to charge a GST, but if you're going to earn less than that for the year, you don't have to charge GST. Now don't Correct. quote me yep. on this, of course. Yeah. But I can't remember if it's 30,000 or whatever the number 30 is. 30 or 35. You, correct. And then yeah, you get a GST like number, which I think you could yep. still have as a sole proprietor, but that's yep. kind of around the time when it's sort of makes sense maybe to incorporate for other taxable benefits, that sort of thing. In general. Potentially, yep. Yep. So yeah, I have I have a GST number. Um, I have all of those types of things. It's, naturally. It's naturally. No big deal. Um, yeah. <laughs> really easy to get to. And so it's it's oh yeah. If you're wondering if you're yeah, man, I don't know, maybe I'm just doing this stuff on the side. It's really, really easy to get a GST number. Of course it is, because they want you know, paying the government more money, but it's easy to do and then you're covered. Yeah, they'll answer so, the phone on the first ring when, you're, that out when you're trying to find out ways to pay the money. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, maybe, oh yeah, so uh, we could talk about some CRM. So that'd be another thing to kind of set up behind the scenes. Uh, I use Jobber. You use Jobber. I am a mm -hmm. Jobber ambassador, so shout out. I'm sponsored a bit by them, but there are other platforms out there. Um, if you want to try it out for free, I do have a link in my bio. Smash that link. Get a bit of a discount. I get a, a bit of a kickback, full transparency. Um, but it's the only CRM I've used. But it's, uh, and if you don't know what a CRM is, it's a customer relationship management software is what it means. So it's basically a place that you can accept uh, like quote requests kind of thing. So uh, what Jobber does is they can give you a link uh, that you can embed into a website or on your social media, whatever it is. Where it's, and you, know, you can make it say free quote, whatever. People click on that. It opens up a page where you can determine what kind of information you want them to give you, where they heard about you, their name, address, all that kind of stuff. And then the software will send you an email from Jobber to tell you that you have a new request. Uh, you can set up automatic, automatic like templates to send them emails back right away saying you've received it. You know, here's, you know, please send me some photos, whatever, if you want faster service, that's what I do. Um, and it keeps track of all that communication. And then you can map out their address, drive to the, to the site. Uh, you can build your quote right there on site with like there's their app or whatever it is, attach photos to it, convert it to an invoice, uh, all that kind of stuff. So it's all this, you know, behind the scenes stuff. So you're not writing things down. Did you, did you have Jobber now? You use I it do, just yeah. for your, mostly for your principal contractors. It just does it make things easier for you or what'd you do before that? Yeah, I, I use it for pretty much everything. Um, I mean, it's there's these one-off jobs that 
I am kind of being the principal contractor for, or I am having that direct communication. I use it for all that, for exactly what you're saying, the ability to send, to have conversations back and forth on quotes, you know, edit line items, do all that kind of stuff, have that interactive sort of quoting process. Uh, I got Jobber, I was probably an operation on my own for about a year before I ended up looking at, at various CRMs. Uh, tried QuickBooks and, and nothing against any of the other ones. I oh, just yeah. really I liked how intuitive. Yeah. QuickBooks into Jobber. We tie yeah, it together. Yep. And you can do that. Yep. You can so do that. So that's another thing you need um, probably. Potentially, depending on how big your and how diverse your income flow is for sure. Uh, for me, Jobber kind of checked all the boxes that I needed for. Uh, and so I've been using it for a while. Prior to that, I used Excel. I was just the guy with the spreadsheet that did it nice. all myself. And then I had like a little template in Excel to do a quote or an invoice or whatever else. And it works fine. Uh, <laughs> I just love it your, sure is I nice. Love your, to... uh, if you're not watching video, Sean had some air, air typing. It was beautiful. Very I'm, I'm a hand <laughs> talker. I use my I use my hands to talk oh, it's all great. the time. It's so great. I just gestures. I just I'm sure it's probably distracting for some people, but I'm working on it. I'm trying. For me, it draws me in. No, it's good. You want to do more of that. <laughs> it draws me in. Anyway, there sorry you go. to interrupt you. Yeah, no. So I used Excel for a lot of years, and it was fine. I mean, it's my biggest complaint was you, you know you work all day and you walk back into the house and you're like all right now it's time to invoice and you're like all right open up excel template and you're just doing all this stuff whereas with a crm with jobber with any of the other crms they all have similar functionality uh i've actually started quoting certain primary contractors when they're like what do you think this is going to cost mm. i can actually build a quote right in it and send it to them, which I probably wouldn't have bothered to do with Excel. I probably would have just given them a ballpark number, you know, verbally sort of thing. Yeah. So now they're getting a little bit more kind of paperwork and a little bit more back end that they can rely on, which makes them happy. Yeah. Uh, but at that point, at the end of the day, I throw all my gear in the truck and I turn the truck on and I hit a button on my phone and poof, the invoice is going off to the client and, and yeah. I'm done. I don't it have to It saves a ton of time. It. It immense. tracks all yep. that information. I know we use it to go back, yeah, and see when people are like, oh, I didn't get this message. And it Jobber shows me that I've emailed them, I've sent them this. It tells you when they've opened they've the quote. They've opened the email, exactly. Like, yep. All this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's great. You can make notes on there or, you know, take a picture of the tree. And I've had this problem too. Like, you go there and they're not home and they got three apple trees. And they're like, prune the apple tree. And you're like, oh, thanks. Okay. So I assume it's the one that's like dying and not the other two <laughs> take a picture not of always. it put it in there and then yep. i show up and they're like no we want that one gone the one that's twice the size and healthy and you're like are you kidding me like yeah anyways it covers my butt but whatever we worked that out but it also you know really comes down to communication again it's clear communication it's not really on you personally it's all it's all written down professionally it looks good and mm -hmm. and then there's you know hopefully no question around what's going to happen what's going on totally so yeah, important to get a, a software uh, bank account. We already mentioned everything. Yeah, can you think of anything else? Kind of well, a website, I guess. So you don't need a website maybe as a contract yeah. climber, but it depends on how your how you best connect with with people, how you best connect with potential uh, employers and companies that would bring you in. And a website is nice. Like there are certain services that. I may potentially do kind of on my own, or I might bring in, you know, a, a somebody to assist me on any particular day that don't have big investment as far as, you know, requirements for equipment, stuff like that. So I, there's stuff that I do put on the website. Uh, I have a website. I'm not super active with it. What is it? It's Throw kind it out of there. Uh, www.rockyarb.ca. Nice. Uh, I'm not super active with it. It kind of got built and it just kind of sits. And like that's most okay. websites. Yeah. Like most websites. Yep. Um, but it's it can certainly help. Uh, I find in today's day and age, uh, social media is the big unlock, frankly. Yeah. And websites and are so, even just like one pagers now. One page websites. Websites are Quick. one pagers. And typically if, okay, as a contract climbing arborist or, or whatever you want to be, Yes, there's some verbalization. There's some writing on there that can help communicate your skill set and, and the certain, you know, specialties that you offer. But inevitably, it's the photos, right? Photos, a photo speaks a thousand words. It's the photos that people are seeing. 
and typically websites now they just have like the automatic populated box of like pull straight from your instagram and put on your website yeah and and the majority of companies now and and there's search there's certainly some out there that are not on social media or don't have much of a presence but most companies have some sort of social media following they're trying to connect to their communities or their customers through social media and they're connecting to you through social media and so even if it's as simple as they flip over to your social mm -hmm. media profile and they see some pictures of like some weird rigging situation or maybe you know you're out doing this particular item or you're pruning this thing they're like wow, this guy offers a lot of cool services. And maybe that's what draws them towards clicking on the website and reading the paragraph about all the yep. different specialties you have. Um, so, so it's, it's is a website required? I, I would say no. Um, not as a contract climbing another, arborist, but... Not as a, yeah, yeah, exactly. Not as a contract climbing arborist. Uh, but it is another avenue for you to create that communication. And whether they find that or it's on your business card that they got or they get to it through your social media, however they come to it, it right. does give you the opportunity to communicate words as well uh, and really highlight some of your specialties. So For sure. It's a uh, website's a, a way to bridge that gap and get in contact with like your market, your client, whoever it's going to be, whatever it is, it depends on your attention. So someone like you who's, yep. you know, doing rope access, you want to have your name kind of out there and available too. And you could use other things like other profiles, social media, like LinkedIn or whatever, and all these things to kind of have totally. these feelers yep. constantly out there. So people are aware that you exist online is generally how we get in connection with people. Um, but you're, you know, doing stuff with different brands, or maybe you want to do some teaching or all these new opportunities could just pop up and expand beyond being a contract climbing arborist. And without a website, that could be a bit more challenging. So at least if you have mm -hmm. a website, it's almost like a pers your own personal <clears throat> bio where you can include all of these things. And if you are going after starting some of your own jobs where you want to subcontract a crew with a chipper and everything, um, it could be really valuable because people need to find you. So that basically yep. when they're going in, if you think from their perspective, uh, they're going in and they're going in a search engine and they're typing in something about tree work or an arborist and you want yours to pop up. So that's the point of a website. Bingo. But yep. if you were looking to just find contractors, which we'll segue into here too quite nicely, mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't think myself anyway, as a tree company owner, I'm not Googling uh, where can I find a contract climber. I would, no. I would doubt probably none of them are. So how, no. how do you as a contract climber get in contact with tree companies or landscape companies to find work? Yeah. So a lot of it is, is connection based. Uh, and, and I will stand up and say that I've been incredibly blessed with some of the connections that I've had and some of the opportunities that I have gotten to connect. Uh, a lot of it comes from being out there, being involved in certain areas of the industry and, and just kind of meeting people. And so I meet a lot of people through Arbor Canada, uh, through both when I was taking courses as a student, uh, as well as now kind of assisting and instructing and those types of things. I meet a lot of folks that way. I meet a lot of folks through various different kind of, you know, vertical expo maple leaf ropes put on the vertical expo met a bunch of folks there uh you know you, you start to get involved in certain avenues of the industry and you start to have these conversations uh, vermeer seminars all these types of things that get put on across canada are, are amazing opportunities to start to build those conversations uh, and inevitably that's how it starts it starts as a conversation nine times out of ten it's pretty rare that I mean, it's happened to me, but it's pretty rare that somebody just reaches out and says, hey, I understand you're a contract arborist. Can you come climb for me? Yeah, unless they've There's heard about usually, you from another company that you work for, like exactly. word of mouth. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that's where it comes from. Uh, there's usually some form of connection that happens and yeah. and that may come through social media conversations that may th come through in-person conversations at a seminar or at a conference or, you know, courses, training opportunities, stuff like that. There's typically some form of conversation that happens and there's typically conversations about, <clears throat> excuse me, other forms of collaboration first. Uh, and so some of the folks that I now do a lot of contracting for, they actually reached out to me and we started conversations around, hey, 
I would like my folks to at least have an understanding of how to get each other out of the tree. And I'm like, well, why don't we just play around for half a day and just like see what happens kind of thing. Uh, and that gives you the opportunity to continue those conversations and to get to know people better. And it's like, yeah. hey, actually, we got this job next week. Why don't you come give us a hand with it? And now you get to showcase your skills and now you're building that rapport and then word of mouth and all these different things. Yeah. So get yourself out there is, yeah. is all I can kind of say. As, out of sight, as... out of mind. So they don't even know you exist, right? How are they exactly. going to hire you? Exactly. If it was yep. me and I was starting out from square one, uh, I'd probably create a social media profile for one, like Instagram is pretty popular, uh, be on Facebook and, and Facebook, especially I would join these Facebook groups. So there's so many small groups, or, I mean, if you're feeling entrepreneurial, start your own Facebook group and get people to join it, create a hub, create a tribe. There's a good book around that, uh, Seth Godin called tribes. I mean, it was okay, but it's pretty good. But it's about that, that concept of uh, creating your own little hub in your own community yourself. Totally, yeah. Um, to find work. So you can think about it from that sense. You don't have to always follow someone else. But um, yeah, we got, I'm sure there's like an Alberta, whatever, your community of arborists, like Calgary arborists, whatever. Get involved yeah. in there, start talking. And even just go out and say, hey, I'm a new contract climber. I'm looking for some work. Does anybody need somebody? You know, maybe you can make a deal with them to start out and do the first day for, you know, little cost kind of thing to feel each other out or mm -hmm. go for coffee first and get that relationship. And once they know you and they can feel like they can trust you and like you, then you're probably going to get work with them. And it shouldn't take too long, honestly, to try and find work as a contract climber, I wouldn't think, but no, and again, I've like. been, I mean, I've been pretty lucky. So it's, it's, you know, I don't want to necessarily stand up on a soapbox and say that, you know, it's super simple. It's God. Yeah. I've been incredibly lucky and I recognize that. Um, there are times when you're looking at the calendar and you're like, you know, I've got work today and tomorrow and then there's nothing like, oh boy. Yeah. And then inevitably that phone call comes and all of a sudden you're booked two weeks out in advance again or a month in advance. Yeah. Uh, so when you're first starting out as a contract climber, it can be a little bit dicey. And so one of the things that... Uh, if you have this opportunity, uh, and, and not many people will, but it's certainly kind of how I sort of started to cut my teeth a little bit. Um, there's a company, local company, I'm, I'm really good friends with the owner. Uh, and so I basically work with them and I work at half the rate that I would charge a regular contract environment. And so they're getting a really good deal. Uh, but I just kind of fall in on any given day. So it's like, right. Hey, three days of the week you know and it might be tuesday wednesday thursday this week it might be monday wednesday friday next week um but we've got this opportunity that you know they've got their crew they're perfectly capable they can handle it but i work at half my rate and i can jump in and we can get the job done half or twice as quick rather right. so they're still making all the same money they're not losing any money by having me show up and we talked about that efficiency side of things uh, but that allowed me kind of the safety net, if you will, to have yeah. steady employment. And yeah, exactly. If you're expensive, it's only going to be once in a while, right? Totally. So. Yep. 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 And it's, it's, it's some of those situations too. I mean, it's, it's, I think we were going to get into start to talk about how we charge as contract climbers and, and kind of what my model of, of, you know, fees and, and that yeah, type why don't of you stuff expand is. on that? Let's go into that. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's certainly, I mean, certainly as I'm starting out, but also to this day, and I sh maybe shouldn't even say this because some of the people I work with, are going to be like, what the heck? Oh, you don't have but, to, if you uh, don't want, we can. No, I'm not saying numbers. <laughs> Trust me. I'm not saying numbers, Okay, but inevitably I have, I have folks that uh, employ me and that bring me in, you know, once, twice a week for the entire summer duration. Uh, and so I, I, I charge them a discounted rate to what I would charge yeah. to the one-off sort of thing. Makes sense. Uh, and it's simply because of the volume, right? And, and I mean, I think, I think that's probably fairly intuitive to most people. So hopefully not anyone out there is like, what the heck? But, uh, yeah, no, it makes I mean, sense if, to me. Like when I call there's you, there's a steady relationship being built. I charge a discounted rate because we have that long-term relationship. So for sure. And then, uh, and then for people in contrast, like myself that call you once in a while, it's, yep. it's not usually to do like production work or whatever, maybe at some point, but it's, uh, it's usually like, holy shit, Sean, 
I totally. need you to bring that winch thing. And we got a whole bunch of technical trees to do. So that costs more money like to do technical, like the, the customer is getting charged for that. They know that too. Like big trees yeah. overhanging yep. their house are more expensive than pruning their apple tree out front. Totally. Yeah. So it's all relative and yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's from a, from a uh, fee perspective. Um, I think it's, it's hourly is kind of the go-to. I think most people would fall back on. Yeah. Uh, I've kind of, I kind of started out doing hourly and I've, I've kind of shifted gears just a little bit. Uh, and specifically because as a contract climber, you know, whether it's efficiency or whether it's just, there's this one weird branch that's out over the solarium and there's, you know, 17 fish in the koi pond that we can't touch and the cats are in the cat house and it's just like it's building and building and building and they want you to deal with that branch and you come in and you set up your lines you rig that branch out it's out of the way it's like okay great thanks see you later and it's like an hour hour and a half of work yeah and it's like wow well, i can't yeah, just a... do our jobs every day like i need to actually you know pay my salary and i need to you know afford where i live and the food that we eat and all these types of things do you have a minimum built in i do yeah and that's kind of where i'm going with this is, okay. is i've moved away from the hourly model uh and basically my minimum is a half day so i charge okay. a half day a half day rate and if it's something super sense. simple up to about four hours of time then it's the half day rate right uh, and that way i'm at least securing my finances a little bit uh and it's like it's also at the point now where it's like if it's a real easy one hour job it's like well you know maybe maybe yeah. we have yeah, the conversation about i'll just help you with the whole thing or something like that uh because yeah. we'll get it done quicker efficiencies all these things so i charge a half day rate just to make sure that you know i am securing my financial future a little bit uh, and then beyond that half day rate uh, i have a full day rate and then if we're going for like the 12 13 14 hour epic then once we get above that kind of eight hour mark i, I kind of charge hourly on top of that so yeah, and I don't know about you, but I I can't do pretty strenuous tree work, thinking and physically mm -hmm. exhausting stuff beyond much of like six hours. Honestly, I'm I yeah. notice for me yep. at least around that six hour mark, I start making stupid mistakes, and I'm looking for ways to make things easier, taking more risk, and it's kind of like mm, you need to have the day spread out a bit more to make it an eight hour mm -hmm. longer day, and not go hard the whole time if you're gonna go beyond six. That's just me, but something to consider as well. Or have no, more people sure. around. Yeah, well, and it's so it's, it's definitely and kind of an interesting segue uh, into some of the stuff we're going to talk about in episode three with regards to the crew and their experience levels. Uh, it's you're absolutely right, and it's it's I think anybody that hits the eight, nine, ten hour mark and still thinks that they're operating at the peak of that mental ability, uh, I would challenge you on that one because yeah. it's, you are getting tired, just physically tired, mentally tired. You know, okay, yeah, we're going to tie the same thing again. Like you're starting to have that complacency creep in. Yeah. And so Especially it's actually when you're new because you're, yeah. you're thinking about everything, how you're managing this new relationship and talking to the homeowner and like trying to remember how to be the most efficient. So when your brain's going hard and fast all the time, there's more stress, yep. 100%. Uh, which also inhibits you being able to think clearly. But burns a lot more calories. Like, I don't, I don't know if you heard this one time, I don't even can't recollect it perfectly, but like competition, like chess players were burning mm. like thousands of calories a day beyond oh, like I the totally average person just from like thinking so intently, so much glucose burnt up in your brain. And yeah, we've all had those your days brain where you're, is a muscle, you're right? studying like, and you're just like, you're exhausted, even though you sat in a yeah. chair all day, right? So 100%. until some of these reps can be kind of subconscious, you know, when you're getting good at it, you can't expend all that energy physically and mentally right away. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I mean, to me, it kind of comes down to the experience level of the crew. Uh, if it is a, a junior crew or a, a green crew and it all comes down to what we've talked about with that communication, right? Have that pre-job scope meeting, have the conversation about it's going to take this long. This is what's involved. I'm going to split this over a day and a half. What do you think about that? How can we, right? Like have that yeah. conversation right up front. Uh, I will say the days that I've gone 12, 13, 14 hour epics, sun up, sun down kind of thing. Uh, it's typically with crews that have some decent experience levels. And because I do this with everybody and, and 
I, it's not like I'm only doing this with the experienced crews. Uh, I run a very open team when I'm on site working and it starts right at the safety paperwork that we talked about. Everybody has a voice. Everybody can speak up and I frankly expect them to speak up. If they see something that is kind of a little bit weird to them, I expect them to ask the question. If they're not quite sure why we're doing it, I expect them to ask why. Uh, there's always that extra set of eyes, right? Yeah. Because I, I can tell from experience, and we'll talk about this next episode when we talk about some close calls, I've had instances where the greenest, most junior person on the ground looks up and says, what, is that how that's supposed to look? That looks a little weird. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I actually put the slip knot on the wrong side of the block and we were just about to drop this thing static and it wasn't going to run anywhere or whatever the case may be, right? Complacency creeps in. It happens mm -hmm. to all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody has a voice. Everybody has a set of eyes. Yeah. And so when I, when I kind of push the envelope and go for really long days, I tend to bias that towards crews that have a little bit more experience just because they are better at kind of catching things. And that's not to say that I'm always making mistakes, but we're all human, right? Yeah. That's the inevitable reality of what we do and, and who we are as, as creatures, if you will. And so having folks that have a little bit more kind of prowess to actually look up and recognize that that's a running bowline or it's not a running bowline, uh, that's when I'm a little bit more comfortable to kind of push the envelope a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I like your points about hourly versus the, the day rate. I think it mm -hmm. allows for a lot more flexibility and less stress too. I know I, I hate doing anything hourly. Um, I feel like it puts all this pressure on you to work harder and faster. You know, like some people, like clients, at least for my normal tree care business, I, I would be like, it's, if this one's difficult, it's like, oh, I'll do a day rate and I'll have some sort of interpretation there of like, oh, it might be max six hours, max eight hours, you know, so a day rate's not like 12 hours, you know, mm -hmm. it could be limited by six oftentimes is what I do say. Um, and then I can go beyond that a little bit, which then they feel like they're getting extra, which is great. I always really leave people feeling like they're getting a little bit extra just for, sure. you know, yeah. good, good business practice. But um, if you finish in four hours, I still expect that day rate generally because I've usually just gone harder you know, yeah, yeah. haven't taken as many breaks, but it's hard to play with that in the relationship with your, with your customers. But if you do it hourly and they, then they don't want to see you taking any breaks. They want to see you going like all out because they're paying for every, every moment of the day. So all of a sudden this perspective shifts on you and it's more pressure that way and you can't take breaks and you know, all this kind of, they don't know what you're doing. You're thinking something out, whatever. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I also prefer the day rate right for that sense where it's like, you can just get it over with. And, you know, I know it's a little bit off topic as far as hourly or, you know, day rates, but I'm struggling with this too, a little bit with employees because I want employees to be motivated and all those things we talked about, but it's difficult when yeah. they're paid by the hour because I, I find I can still motivate people that work with me and they will work hard and get things done. But sometimes our days are maybe only three, four hours here in uh, small town Cochrane. And then it's like, you know, I get to go home and make the same amount, but you don't because you work True. so hard. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I give them other incentives and bonuses. And I know people often recommend putting people on salary for that sense. Um, but it's hard when you're, when you're seasonal and you're, or for me, at mm -hmm. least I don't have mm -hmm. enough work to have a, a salary uh, employee. I don't think yet, but do you have any uh, insight on that? <laughs> what I should do? <laughs> yeah, well, and, and uh, I mean, not necessarily insight, but I guess maybe a question um, just with regards to quoting it. Uh, so if, if you're quoting the job based on a day rate, uh, you're basically quoting that that employee is going to be working for the day, yeah. right? That's how the job is built. Uh, and so I, I think, like, would you then just pay that day rate to the employer if yep. they worked six hours you'd pay them six hours and you get a little bit extra in the business account like right. how would this you was, structure that this was sort of my idea and i tried it a couple of days um was yeah basically breaking down that salary or that expectation mm -hmm. for the day which could be good for other people out there in a similar situation but uh you know i price it out i think whatever it's going to be a five hour day today going around doing these mm -hmm. jobs you know based on experience this can always ebb and flow 
uh, maybe communicate that with your employee that we're expecting a five hour day. If it goes any longer, of course, I'm going to pay you more. But if we're done in four yeah. hours, you're still getting paid five hours. Yes. Yeah. And that way you can reward them for uh, being more efficient. And then if they're constantly under, it's kind of on me for, uh, you know, keeping it too long all the time. Yeah. Trim up the quoting a little bit. Yeah. Bring it back a little bit. Although I kind of, you know, you kind of almost want to encourage them to always be achieving a little bit quicker as long as they're not making, totally. you know, mistakes or doing a shit job. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's all about that balance. Anyways. Yeah. Thought I'd just uh, yeah. see what you thought about that. Yeah, I mean it's it's, uh, I mean the the experience I've had working for small companies and I've, I've never been involved in a massive tree care company, twenty thousand employees, stuff like that. I mean my experience over ten years has always been with small, you know, one, two, maybe three crew sort of tree service companies, uh, and and we operated in much the same way. So the day was structured. We would we would build jobs off of either a half day or a full day. So this is a full day or this is a half day. And if this is a half day job, we might put another half day job in, you know, route density. We might put another half day job in the afternoon to try and build a full kind of eight hour day sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're kind of, you're, you're paid off of the job. So if we would go to a full day job and we finished in six and a half, seven hours and we got back to the yard a little bit early, either, Hey, guess what guys? It's Friday. Take the hour. We're paying you for it. Go home. Uh, or it's like, this is the perfect opportunity to start to bounce into some of that chainsaw sharpening or adjusting chipper blades or doing greasing or whatever maintenance you need to do. Uh, that's kind of been my experience with the small business thing. Yeah. Uh, completely dependent on how much equipment you have. Like, you know, you're running a trailer, you're not running a big chipper. So that's less maintenance you have to do. You've only got, you know, five, six saws that you have to deal with and you only used two that day. So, you know, maybe sharpening isn't even something you have to deal with, but, uh, I mean, scaling it appropriately, but certainly my experience has been, you know, we're, we're quoting jobs off a half day or a full day. Uh, and then if it finishes in seven hours, then the pay is still for the eight hour full day. So if you were to give me advice, I wanted to break into being a contract climber, mm -hmm. uh, as far as charging i'm just trying to think of uh you know someone new wanting to do this they're a little bit nervous uh nervous to even charge and ask for certain amounts of money it's like it's mm -hmm. pretty common i personally would probably like go after landscapers too like i have my community mm -hmm. whether i'd hang out with their organizations or some of their meetings or reach out to them through social media cold call them whatever email say hey i'm an arborist have you guys ever thought about maybe expanding if you have any tree stuff come up i'm happy just to come in as a little contractor help you out Maybe, maybe you take away some of the debris. Maybe you don't, I don't know how that would work, but, mm -hmm. um, and starting out maybe like 30 bucks an hour or something, I would imagine they're paying their employees, you know, minimum, which is 15 here up to like 20 bucks an hour to do work. So if you're a specialist and you're contracting, maybe you can go a little beyond that 25, 30 starting out. Would you think that'd be fair for someone? Yeah, I would. We're going to get into I trouble. Would... No, not necessarily. I would encourage people to properly understand and assess what we call the hidden costs uh, of contracting. Uh, Great segue. I was trying to find a way to segue to that too. Honestly, because <laughs> I, I will I will say right now at $30 an hour, you're, you're in trouble. Long. You're yeah. in trouble. You're not going to last long. Uh, Depending on your business model, I guess I'll say that. So my business model, and I know some of the other contract climbers that, that I collaborate with in the area, our business model is the same. And our business model is we're fully self-sufficient. We come in with the gear. We come in with everything we need. We come in with our safety paperwork. We come in with our insurance, all of these extra pieces. At $30 an hour, I can't afford to pay my insurance, pay for the fuel for my saws, pay for the equipment upkeep that I need to pay for, pay for my vehicle that I'm using to travel, pay for the fuel, the vehicle insurance. It's so hard all to these things add, add that all up and figure out, because they say 100%. you can figure out what your daily cost has to be. So if you break up the year, you know, you work five days yep. a week, then you can figure out, oh, I need to make 250 bucks a day, five days a week, just for, to for cover eight months the a costs. year just to break even. So if you're Bingo. taking days off, that has to be made up somewhere, yep. you know, but to figure that all out is, is kind of tricky. 
it's immensely tricky. Uh, and it's, it's honestly, and I, I will say from experience, when I began this journey of sort of contract arboriculture, contract climbing, it was something that I struggled with because I had an idea of what I would like to make to make this feasible from a work-life balance perspective, feasible for replacing the income I was getting from other sources, uh, et cetera. I knew what I wanted to make, but I didn't necessarily, I mean, you're never really able to fully calculate those hidden charges. And so I kind of came up with what my day rate would be or what my hourly charge would be because I started charging hourly. And uh, I struggled a little bit because I'm like, this seems a ridiculously high. This seems high enough to the point that it's like, I don't think anybody's going to be interested in hiring this no-name guy that's brand new into contract climbing for the rate that I was hoping to make. Yeah. Uh, and so you you have that internal battle. And then you say, well, maybe I'll drop it down a little bit. And so I kind of hovered a little bit and I found what was like the line where yeah. all of a sudden it's like, it feels like I'm charging a lot, but when you start to factor in all of these things, right? Your CRM, if you're using a CRM, but if you're not using a CRM, guess what? You still have to pay annual subscription to Microsoft now to use Excel. Well, and it's more time else. for you. So then when you're not working, you're spending an hour every evening doing 100%, that stuff. 100%. So you start to factor in these costs and you realize like, I'm actually making zero income <laughs> and that's everything why i'm bringing in is paying for everything else that's why companies so, fail after a year or two and they realize oh my god we're not making any money which is also challenging for people that do run uh legit businesses not to say they're not legit but they're maybe inexperienced or didn't set things up properly but when there's a revolving door of arborists or companies out there in any industry that are they either don't, don't understand it or they're lowballing for too long to try and break into the market. It hurts the whole industry mm -hmm. uh, because you know the other people that are charging enough and are aware of how much they need to charge aren't now hurting because they're not getting jobs. Because everyone's like, "Well, this guy can do it for half the price." And this happened to totally. me just recently in town here too. Like, yeah, albeit it was a super simple job, but it still involved uh, climbing and felling a couple tops into a backyard in the perfect spot. The guy had already tried to cut up most of the tree himself. And I was like, you know, to come over here and do this, like it's going to be, I'm like 400 bucks probably. He's like, well, the other guy can do it for 225, he said. Yeah. And I'm like, really? Like I can't, I can't even go to a job for less than like 250. It's like kind of like an almost absolute minimum. Like from what I found yeah. out from my model over the years of doing things, it's just, it's just not worth it. And there's guys like yeah. Johnny who have like big equipment, you know, guys like their target market and types of jobs are a lot bigger. They're not doing small pruning jobs really anymore. And I think their minimums are like, you know, a thousand bucks or something like that. Like they're not even going to show up. So it's got to be, yeah. he's niched that market. So sure. Yep. And that, all that exists. Yeah. That exists in the contract world too. I mean, it's, it's folks that are maybe running a small tree service or involved in the management of a small tree service that are feeling exactly what you're feeling with regards to people lowballing and you know well if i want to get any contracts away from any of these people i got to come in like with zero margins here uh if you're feeling that the contract world might be a way away from that unfortunately it happens in the contract world too yeah. I mean, inevitably there's, there's contract climbers or contract arborists that are always going to come in a little bit cheaper, try and lowball yeah. things to win all that business. And it's, it's an unfortunate side of the service industry. Yeah. And, and the only thing I can say to that is it will be frustrating. Uh, build your brand, right? Build yourself, build those connections, build that communication with folks because then they start to see the other aspects you can bring to the job site. Yeah. And now it's not about the low ball anymore. It's about the skills and the and the mindset that you and bring. And build so. your confidence, you know, yeah. with whatever that's going to take. That's a huge subject of how to do that. But I mean, if, if you're showing up to jobs and to people, you know, business-wise being kind of like timid and I don't know, is this okay if I do this, whatever. It's like the people are like, uh... Okay, like what's what's the problem here? Are you inexperienced? Are you like you're not confident in what you're going to charge too? And you need to be. And if you come off as confident, like no, this is what it costs and whatever. I know what I'm doing. Here's this and this and this. You have everything laid out yeah. and prepared. Then it's not a big deal because ultimately they want to totally. be able to trust you and be safe and whatever. So 
yeah, yeah. That's, that's a tricky one. But uh, just to throw another number out there, I know when I started as an arborist in town, I know it, was, I know it wasn't a contract climber, but I was uh, you know low overhead. It took me longer to get jobs done back then because I was still learning. So I was on site for quite a bit sure. longer. I was like averaging like 50 bucks an hour. And I thought I was like, you know, just rocking it. Text Johnny and he's like, yeah, absolute minimum 50 bucks an hour if you want. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I, I was looking for some kudos. And he's like, yeah, no, dude. <laughs> but he's like, absolute minimum. So yeah. just for a number to keep in mind. But of course, that $50 was because it was taking me longer. So as I got sure. more efficient, I was doing jobs in half the time. Now I'm doing the same jobs for 100 bucks an hour. But then you're balancing volume of work versus not, how much time off you want versus how much you're working. So yeah, again, trying to figure out what you need to pay per day. I know a lot of, well, I shouldn't say, I don't know what other arborist companies charge. It's a wide range of how much they're trying to make. Um, but yeah, some days it's two, 300 bucks an hour for what I'm doing with Cochrane Tree Care. But again, that doesn't incorporate the time I go to dump stuff off at the end of the day, the time in between everything else. It's kind of like an on-site cost, which kind of covers other costs. Sure. I don't yeah. know. It's yep, so, it's so vague, but just trying to give people a general idea of what yeah. they want to be aiming for out there, considerations to, to charge. So maybe they can ask and around think... in the community what people are charging. Bingo. And that's, that's kind of where I was going to go with this is, is I think, you know, to keep it sort of specific to your locale and your location, uh, especially with contract climbing. And if that's the avenue you're looking to pursue, start to look at job postings, start to have a look around at some of the companies, you know, the two, three, four crew, uh, tree companies that are operating in your area, have a look at what they're paying those lead climbers. And, and like, I know what it would be in Alberta approximately that may not, well, I know it's not what it's, it is in BC. It's not what it is down in the States, it, very location specific, but find what the lead climber rate would be for some of those, like, you know, yeah. medium sized tree companies. Uh, and honestly tack on anywhere from like 30 to 50% onto yeah, that for overhead because costs. That's and... the hidden charges that you're not necessarily thinking of. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's, that's where you should be targeting to charge as a contract climber. If you're coming in, looking at an hourly pay rate, uh, for that sort of thing. Yeah. And one way to approach it too, I think, you know, you can go on like the, the Canadian arborists say Facebook page. Yep. Guys are, are going to be happy to share things cause they're, they're more anonymous and they're not competing with them, whatever, but maybe target your question towards business owners as opposed to contract climbers. So they're not scared mm -hmm. to share their number, but say, Hey, what are you paying for a contract climber? What's your range that you're willing to pay for contract climber on site? You probably get some good numbers there or just search, search in the search bar on those forums. There's probably people that have asked this question multiple times and you go through there 100%. and start filtering yep. through. So that's what I recommend. Now you've brought up hidden costs a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Um, what comes to mind for you for these hidden costs? I mean, we talked about CRM software, the insurance, the WCB, like, yeah, uh, I mean, all of this stuff fuel. is, is like, you know, you're going to burn fuel. I mean, fuel, honestly, I will say fuel is the big one. Uh, God, and it adds up fast. hundred percent. 200 bucks. I mean, my truck yesterday. Well, yeah. And that's just it is all of a sudden your vehicle use, uh, you could be driving the tiny little Honda Civic. I would suggest that you probably are going to want something with a little bit more cargo capacity. Uh, and so like I run a quarter ton truck, I will be the first to put my hand up and admit that the quarter ton truck I run is not great on fuel and it's known to not be great on fuel. And all of us Toyota Tacoma cool. owners just kind of look the other way. It's the <laughs> elephant in the room that nobody wants to actually address. Yeah. But durable, reliable, vehicle. anyway. We're getting off the point. Uh, you're going to be driving a lot. And it's it's no longer are you just driving from your place of residence to the yard to get on the company truck to drive to this job, to drive to that job, to drive to this job, back to the yard. You're now using your personal vehicle to do all that commuting. Uh, and the kilometers add up really quickly. So now you're dealing with the fuel for your and vehicle. Maintenance. You're dealing with the maintenance on your vehicle because you're going to put on kilometers a lot quicker. You're going to go through, you're going to need oil changes more rapidly than you might think you will. Uh, all of these things add up. Fuel for your saws is something that honestly kind of took me by surprise. I knew I was going to have to buy fuel for the saws. I personally run an alkalite fuel. I run aspid just because for my saws, that's they perform the best oh, on it. Expensive. I don't have to worry. It's expensive. I knew it was expensive. 
but I didn't necessarily know certain saws in my fleet really go through that fuel quickly. And so now, hmm. after a few years of this, I've started to learn, like, you know what? I probably don't need to reach for the 390 when I can do it with the 365, and it might take a little bit longer. I can't push it quite as hard, but it sips fuel versus the big pig that the 390 is. Stuff like that. You start to learn intricacies with your saws. I've never thought of that, but, actually. Uh, <laughs> totally, totally. Sometimes I'm like, I'm just using the 572, so I don't have to, it's heavier, but I don't have to bend over as far because the bars are long. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, totally, totally. But uh, those, like, those are the hidden costs, right? Is all those little things that you're like, yeah, fuel. I know I'm gonna have to pay for fuel, but now all of a sudden you're driving your vehicle two, three times more than you would in a day, and it all adds up. So, yeah, yeah. Websites, domain subscriptions, yep. like your bank account, these fees, some of these business bank, bank account accounts. Fees, you go yep. over your transaction yep. level. That adds up your yep. trade name registry, all those things that we had already talked about. Um, yeah, can you think of anything else that's kind of been uh, any standout hidden? I mean, the training could be one too, like if you're gonna go and, not totally. that everyone's gonna yep. go out to these conferences and do these things, but a lot of people do travel to keep up on their CEUs, so that means they have to take courses or travel to an expo. Well, and that's, that? it's actually kind of an interesting um, point with regards to hidden costs is because we've talked about how to connect with business owners and how to get your name out there. And we've identified training courses, conferences, all these types of things as ways to bridge that gap of communication and start to, to you know, make that brand for yourself. And that comes with cost. There's plane tickets, there's rental vehicles, there's hotel fees, there's, you know, maybe I'll drive to the conference because it's cheaper than the, the plane ticket. Well, it's still tons of kilometers on your personal vehicle and all these things. So it's, it's yeah, another big hidden cost is depending on the environment you work in and how much you get an opportunity to communicate and connect with people. Uh, you may have to do a little bit of traveling to do some of that, to build that, that business for yourself. So yeah, yeah, totally. I guess just try and keep track of everything if you can. Yeah. And you can use Jobber for that, for example, as an expense tracking thing in there or whatever you want to do. Uh, I use Dropbox to take pictures of all my receipts and whatever, but you, it might take almost a year of work to yes. kind of then go back and then make sure you go back and review all of these things. Cause you might find costs yep. that you don't even need to have that totally. you can just get rid of, or maybe you should spend more. Um, and then advertising is one, but I mean, I don't think as a contract climber, you need to advertise cause it's kind of more of a word of mouth, get to know people type thing, but yeah, yep. it's uh, you know, it depends on what you're going to be doing with it. Of course, if you're trying to get jobs where you're going to be contracting them, then you got to pay in advertising. Advertising is expensive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for sure immensely expensive yeah yep yeah and that's controllable i guess depending on how much you want to do with it yeah okay so there's a few things um you could do kind of beyond being a contract climbing arborist or a contract mm -hmm. arborist um, to expand upon uh things that you can charge for and earn keep the brain healthy and fresh or once you've obtained a lot of those skills um you've done some of these already but I had some ideas there. Maybe you can lend some light on them, but like maybe consulting, uh, some risk assessments, uh, mm -hmm. tree appraisal, maybe some training, different things like that. What's the, the common path you think for most climbing arborists beyond removing trees for other companies? Yeah, I think if, if you're looking for that diversity and you're drawn towards creating, you know, that, that myriad of experiences in your day to day. I think, uh, a big one that you can really get involved in is tree risk assessment, uh, is having these conversations with folks about the level of risk, you know, take a track course, get involved in these types of things, uh, learn how to use forms and stuff to Our actually deliver a report. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I say, uh, so you, if, if you're ISA certified, then you can become track certified and you can go down that road. Uh, a plug for Arbor Canada. Arbor Canada offers a tree risk assessment, comprehensive tree risk assessment program. Boom, I just uh, got a, mine. Boom, there it is. Uh, don't necessarily have to be ISA certified to do that. So it's it's a similar kind of curriculum as to what track would teach you, but it's Arbor Canada's version and, and it's super, super great knowledge to have. Um, so there's there's that avenue you can get down. Uh, I do a lot of kind of homeowner conversations, kind of consulting, if you will. 
Um, so not necessarily formal risk reports or appraisals or anything like that. Uh, but in my neck of the woods, we have a lot of property owners. They have large properties. They have no idea what they're looking for, but maybe they saw their neighbor's tree come down in the windstorm two weeks ago, or they've heard that there's some issues with a lot of the trees in the area. Uh, and so a lot of what I do from that side of things is an opportunity to just connect with homeowners and walk with them around the property and yep. start pointing things out to them, educate them on certain yep. things uh, and, and, you know, build on that side of things as far as, you know, what we're looking for and the trees in the area, the how the root systems work in this area, the soils that we're dealing with, compaction, the way that affects the trees, uh, all these different types of things. And a lot of times they'll be like, hey, well, I want to take that tree out right there. And now you can start to have the conversation about, you know, the way trees class, clash with each other to mitigate wind forces and all these types of things. I mean, trees are communal organisms. You start to pick one or two out of a stand and it's going to cause detriment. And all of a sudden, the trees that weren't failing, the next windstorm they yeah. do because you've changed the wind patterns and everything else. I'm smacking my microphone. But uh yeah, so that's that's a good avenue to get involved in is kind of that those conversations with homeowners and I guess the consulting side of things, uh, especially because it gives me an opportunity to stay sharp in all of these other avenues that arborists need to be knowledgeable in. Right? It's not yeah, and just it only helps and supports, going and running saws. Supports Bingo. your knowledge. We talked about episode one as far as uh, understanding the tree, so you're being an advocate for the trees, and you can yeah. lend some insight or opinion on on what's to be done because not all the time when you show up to do these jobs uh it may not be the the right thing to do from your opinion or your experience and they just might not they just might be unaware so maybe you can go there and you can totally. offer alternatives which could be more work or it could be less but uh again it comes with experience i guess and taking some of these extra courses uh tree biology or insect and disease management or yep. you know some soil soil courses on how soil works and I did permaculture and that led me down the soil road and I loved that stuff. And that really talks about natural systems and how all these trees, like you said, grow together underground and ways to look after them and removing that landscape fabric and rock and putting down mulch and compost and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. that's what I do with consults as well. But uh, keep in mind, obviously, if this is a great opportunity then to have a website of some sort and maybe look into some advertising. So those things we were talking about before, because yep. if you're going to be found by homeowners directly, that's generally what you're going to need. But then uh, maybe you earn more money by doing these consults and it's great showing up for consults. You can wear just some normal, nice clothes and peel over. You have to bring all your gear. You come out totally. and you just talk about trees and you're hired for your knowledge. And oftentimes when you're hired for your knowledge on something, uh, you can often be paid more for your time doing that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and maybe to put you on the spot, because I know that is a big piece of your kind of business model and, and where you have diversity in your tree service. Uh, how much would you say, how much of your business comes from consulting and how much of it is just purely phone you up to remove or prune a tree or whatever? Yeah, it, uh, it's been getting busier, I guess, with consults. I, I do need to change my website more towards mm. that because like we were talking about before, made the website dumped it, you start getting enough work, you just totally. don't worry yeah. about it, right? Yeah. But it is something I've been, I've been meaning to do. Um, so this will hopefully increase business in that sense because I, I love doing consults. Yeah. And I find when you, you talk to them, um, it builds a customer kind of for life. And they trust you and you spend that time with them to really yeah. explain what you know and they're interested and then they don't know what they don't know until you tell them. And uh, then you can offer advice and then I still usually leave with a quote for something that they want to do. And then it's a phase process over time and they're always calling you anyways. So I probably do, I don't know, average, it could range maybe like one to four or five even consults in a week. Oh, and wow. that came, okay. that came over time. Not always. It could it definitely can range. Right. Um, and I think it, maybe it's more, attractive in say Cochrane. I'm just assuming because of our Chinooks tree health here, like trees struggle to grow, um, being in the foothills, it's mostly grasslands in our areas and people are trying to grow species that aren't necessarily native. You know, they're not growing in natural forest stands around this area. Mm -hmm. So they're always, they're always struggling and people are, you know, obviously taking a tree out of an unnatural environment 
from a nursery or shipping, whatever it is, and plunking it in an urban environment where it's been compacted from, you know, whatever. And they use, they use stuff on their grass to kill weeds. And like, it's just like the tree has everything going against it. <laughs> you know, totally. thank God yeah. the sun comes out every day consistently, but <laughs> you know, so then they usually call you because they're like, Hey, I think my tree needs to be removed or, and what I do is, uh, on my website, because it got busier, I put a little search bar in there or a little, sorry, drop down bar that says, uh, are you wanting a free quote for pruning or removing, or are mm -hmm. you interested in, uh, information about insect disease, consultation, questions type thing is what I have it written as. Sure. Um, yeah. So then it automatically triggers their brain to like, oh, he said free quote for pruning or, or removal, which means obviously I can generally show up when you're not home. I don't have to work around your schedule. You've, although I like to meet people because you can then kind of convince them. But when you're busy, sometimes you just need to go when you can go. Mm -hmm. So it gets them in the mindset of like a consult's coming, that there might be a cost to it. And then my automatic email that comes from Jobber um, just gives them another heads up like, hey, if you're wanting more information, this may take some time. Here's some things that we discuss in, say, a consult. Uh, I charge 150 bucks for them. And that can range anywhere from like 30 minutes to, I mean, I won't put a time limit on it, but usually after an hour and a half, people are pretty like tapped out. Totally, including yeah. me so brain overload yeah so it's not like super lucrative you know doing that but if it's like under an hour it's it's not bad but again it's like a sure. way to sell yeah. yourself and build uh customer relations for future work and some people honestly call totally. and they pay for a quote or sorry for a consult and i get there and it's all i all i really wanted was like a quote you yeah, know, yeah. or they have a, a super simple question. They're just like, Hey, what's this? Oh, it's like, Oh, that's hypoxylin canker on your popular. And like, okay, cool. But then I'm like, Hey, Will it did kill you, it? yeah. Did you notice <laughs> this and this and this, and here's why it's happening, mm -hmm. you know, the root problem of everything. And then their minds are blown. They love it. Got them hooked nice. on permaculture, everything. And yeah. So, but again, I want to change the website and, uh, my plan is here is to, uh, honestly, like use AI to help me too, build some outlines and do sure. a whole bunch of blog posting. So I don't do blogs, but to help me time wise and do a bunch of blogs around tree health and that kind of thing. And then discuss how I like doing consultations and some, some background I have in that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so that when people come they're they're looking to you for that kind of information because some arborists are, you know, just wrapped more up in removals and pruning and that sort of thing. And they don't even talk about consults right. and me and Johnny yeah, sort of talked totally. about this in the first episode. But uh, to be able to charge for consults, though, I think, you know, you obviously have to be confident around that and busy enough that, you know, you, you don't have the time to spend answering all these questions for people. And it's sort of also hard to navigate, you know, free quotes that sort of turn into consults and everything. But totally, you yeah. got to be able to handle all that stuff and know what you're talking about before you can charge for them, too. But do you do you do consults or? Uh, I do. It's, it's, and it's usually cause somebody kind of, you know, word of mouth finds out that, Hey, I'm an arborist and they reach out and say, Hey, can you come have a look at this kind of stuff? Um, from a, from a financial standpoint, it's not, I would say it's such a minute part of my income that I'd like, I wouldn't even classify it as being significant in any way. Um, but it is something that, and exactly what you're saying. And, I kind of mentioned it a couple times uh, with that transition from sort of managing a small tree service to being on my own as the contract guy. Uh, I was worried I was going to miss having that opportunity to connect with homeowners. Uh, and so having those occasional consults and those those opportunities to connect is, I've certainly found a lot of value in it. Uh, and honestly, it gives you a good opportunity to have some of those conversations about, you know, okay, now we're talking about pruning, we're talking about cabling, we're talking about whatever the case may be, a removal if required. Well, can you do that for us? And now you're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation as a contractor, you can start to explain how things work and you can recommend a company and they're like, well, would you be there? And you'd be like, well, absolutely. You know what? We'll have that conversation. We'll make sure that we're in here as well. Uh, and now you're helping the other company that brings you employment and bringing them in on it. And you're going to get employment with it anyway. And now everybody's happy. The homeowner's happy. Yeah. The customers the you know, the general contractor or whatever you want to call it, the, the primary contractor's happy. You're happy. Um, but yeah, the consults certainly give you an opportunity to have that connection. And it's something that kind of what you were saying with the blog posts, um, I am not 
a, a writer. I'm not a big blogger. I'm not anything like that, but I do enjoy connecting with my community. And so when I was managing that small tree service with the local community, I was putting out posts in the discussion group for the local community about things to look for in your yard, considerations, what's going on with the soils, what's going on with the root plates, stuff like that. Uh, and frankly, it was immense towards building that company's presence in the community and really building that root density as well as that community connection. And I think that's so critical for small business, not just contract climbing, but small business in general mm -hmm. is to put yourself out there and build those connections, whether it's with your community as a small tree service, which is something that you've done incredibly well through your involvement in various, like, you know, you're at the garden center giving talks yeah. on permaculture and all this types like tree planting. It's, it's, you know, you're building this community presence and you're building this, this community environment around you. Uh, but as a contract climber, the same thing goes for the companies in your area and starting to build that communication and build that community among the company holders, because now you're going to be at employment out of it. So, yeah. And your community is, like we said, the market you're looking for target is arborist companies. Mm -hmm. yep. Kind of like me with Atmos tree, I'm looking to connect with arborist companies. So I've changed, it's a completely different thing. Like instead of doing the stuff locally, like you said, greenhouse, we got some collaborations for some giveaways and workshops at the greenhouse and, you know, go to the horticulture meetings or whatever, or take part on some Facebook forums, like whatever it is, just to be part of it. And some mm -hmm. people recognize you, which I, I love doing. But then with like, as a contract climber or at most tree, it's like, I got to get to know other companies. So how do you do that? It's a lot totally. more challenging. Yeah. <laughs> So it you, can you, be. It can you be. have to go and like be at these uh, places, maybe where you gather accreditation through different things. So maybe you join the ISA, maybe you go to the, the Prairie Chapter Conferences. And it's not only good for um, learning, because they talk about all sorts of great stuff, but then you're going to be there and you're going to be networking and talking to other arborists, primarily business owners probably, that are going to be there. Yep. And that's that's your audience. So go to there or like go to some sort of expo. Like next week I'm going out to the ISA Ontario conference. I'm super excited for. Totally. Um, yeah. I mean that kind of stuff. So works good. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. How much of your business? And, and I asked this because it's something that I've kind of wrestled with from, you know, the ability as me as a contract climber, uh, kind of something that I can do sort of on my own is, is planting trees, right? So there's certain customers that, you know, I've gotten involved in a removal process or, or their friends or family or however that relationship's worked. And they've, they've asked the question about tree planting. And so I guess my question to you is how much of your business being a very small tree service, um, you know, as probably as close to the contract climber by himself as, as you could probably get, how much of your business gets brought in with, with tree planting and that side of things? Uh, I'd say about zero yeah yeah i don't plant any trees i've had i do have people request to right. transplant trees and plant trees in cochrane um it's usually a specific request like they want a tree planted as opposed to like i'm removing one and they want to plant more got it but okay. i'm just like i'm not set up for it i don't think most arborist companies are and it takes so much time to then talk to them tell them what tree they should plant because they don't know mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. oftentimes they want you just to bring it in or you could have them go to the nursery but then you got to work with the nursery and get it paid for then someone's got to pick it up you got to drive to their place then you got to dig a friggin hole or you got to have a <laughs> piece of equipment that you got to rent spade or something and unless yeah. you're doing tons of these things you don't have trailers and equipment to plant some companies do uh, mm -hmm. which is great great on them that they've started a sort of tree planting thing but generally i, I send them to a nursery which is then a larger caliper tree because then they have the equipment to come and plant. So um, this is why I started Atmos Tree because we were, I think I'm in the same boat as most arborists out there as we're pruning and removing trees. We all love to plant trees and see more trees go on the ground, but the mm -hmm. clients oftentimes don't ask uh, or they don't have space in their yard. You know, this is why I think right. there's a bit of a yep. failure with some of these bylaws and things they have out east or wherever to plant trees again in your yard to remove them is that the homeowner doesn't necessarily have the space or want the trees. So if they don't want them in their yard again, like they're not going to get looked after. They're not going to grow good. So again, yeah, yeah. Atmos tree plug. Um, that's why I charge recycling fees now to every single client that has a removal, unless it's under 250 bucks for an invoice or it's, 
you know, and if it's more than one removal on the same job, I only charge it once. So that overall, uh, I tell all my clients, I'm planting more trees than I remove. And they're not being right. planted directly back in their yard, but they're being planted elsewhere. So that's where the alliance comes in. And there's different plantations like, you know, all over Canada are going to be all over the world here as, as things move on. But people are reaching out to me with ideas where to plant. And um, I did do it with my pilot project part of the year with, uh, so I guess I kind of was, but when it was a pilot with Cochrane Tree Care, say last year, we did plant mm-hmm. with the environmental, the Cochrane Environmental Action Committee here. And I kind of collaborated with them. So another community kind of building thing. They already yeah. had stuff in place with their branches and banks program to plant trees down by the river. Um, and then I would look at things like that, say, to then take those recycling fees and fund two trees to get planted for each removal, right? And then it would go back in the community, and then I could um, tell people that I'm planting back in the community, which a lot of people enjoy. Uh, so I'm trying to do that with a lot of other arborists with Atmos tree, but also mm-hmm. planting abroad in other places too, where trees can grow bigger and faster and have more impact and you know, work with people that are less fortunate to help bring them out of poverty because they can harvest things off the trees, go to market and whatever. But uh, anyways, I digress back. That was my Atmos tree plug. So if anyone wants to join Atmos tree, I would love to have you. It's free for Arbors to join because all of the costs are covered um, through these recycling fees. In Canada, we charge $25. In the US, we're charging $20 US. And we're open to international. I just don't have anybody internationally yet part of the alliance. So yeah, I mean, uh, it's coming. You're, you can do it as a contract climber too. Yeah, well, and, and maybe to build on your plug there, I mean, it's it's uh, being involved with Atmos Tree. I mean, it is something that I actually put on my invoicing. Uh, so when I contract climb for another company, it's it's a conversation that we have. And I provide them with all of the information and I provide them with all of the marketing and brochure packages that are provided when you join Atmos Tree. Yeah, thanks uh, and, for including that. <laughs> well, I left that out. But it's it's I try to make it better awesome for you. because from from a from a company owner or as a contract climber from my perspective, I mean, it, I really don't have to do a whole lot. I just I get provided with the marketing materials. I add it on my invoice. Part of that again, circling back to the communication, the pre job scope meeting, I communicate this right with the folks that are that are bringing me in, and I say this is the initiative. This is why it's important. Here's the marketing equipment. Here's everything that's involved with it. They typically have that conversation with the homeowner. So I add the $25. They usually just pass it on to the homeowner. And then if they decide that this is something that they want to buy into and become Atmos Tree members themselves, I don't charge it anymore because now it's just, it's still coming through. It's still, we're still planting two for every removal, but now I don't add it on my invoice because they're already doing it. And we're not like double dipping sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, so as a contract climber, Definitely. it is another really interesting way to build that communication and build that community around you. And it gives you a talking point with, with those companies to, to kind of differentiate yourself. So for sure. Yeah. Yeah, buddy. That's what, uh, thank you very much for all those kind words about Atmos Tree. It's taken off and mm-hmm. it's doing really well. And I appreciate all the things you share and support yeah. with Atmos Tree because we're oh, kind of using, so cool. uh, your model as among everyone else's to, uh, you know, to feel it out and then be fluid with it and work with everyone that's part of it to try and, you know, it can't make everyone happy, of course, but we're, we're taking everyone's feedback openly and honestly to try and uh, bend, you know, the path of where it's going to go uh, mm-hmm. to see, to do what arborists um, want it to do for them and how we can benefit them. So like you said, the marketing material, give you some decals for your truck, which is kind of obvious, says tree cycle on it. And then contract climbers, yes, of course, because you're not charging the client directly, you would put it onto the principal contracting arborist's bill. And then, not, yeah, most oftentimes they're just like, oh, what's this? And you talk to them and then they'll join and then you're not charging them anyways. Totally. But as yeah. long as we're getting yeah. two trees in the ground for each tree removal, I think it's awesome. And it's it's going to grow. And man, we're going to have like at most tree forests. Like I'm already like planning Isn't working with Oz awesome. right now to do it. And it's going to be exclusive at most tree forests, man. It's going to be sweet. That's fantastic. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Cool, man. Yeah. So uh, we should get pretty close to wrapping it up here. But uh, as far as transferable things, you, we've already alluded to this a little bit. But beyond consulting, you know, tree appraisal, getting into doing some training, uh, maybe you can find some income even through some brand ambassador relationships. Once you build mm-hmm. these skills and you make more of a presence online or in the community. These are all different ways to make more money and diversify in a board culture. 
Um, you can diversify, especially if you're an independent kind of worker into other avenues. So like a big one for you, rope access, you can still be Correct. independent, yep. have your gear, travel in your own vehicle, contract yourself to another company, um, getting into maybe some rescue type stuff. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have some notes here of, uh, you know, getting into like more research or preservation or something like that. You know, me going into Atmos tree, for example, will probably totally, transition yeah. me into a, looking after just that exclusively eventually, but. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's, again, it's, it's kind of this environment where I've been so fortunate for some of the, the opportunities that have kind of been offered to me and presented to me that I've been able to take advantage of. But I mean, certainly as somebody who's, kind of going down that avenue of contract climbing or contract arboriculture, you do have a lot of flexibility and you have the ability to become very diverse. Uh, and we've mentioned this a couple of times as those experiences just benefit everything else you're doing. You know, there's skills that I've picked up in rope access or rope rescue that I directly attribute over to our boar culture. And there's stuff from our boar culture that I can attribute over to there. It's uh, it's all transferable skills and it's all experience that is building you as a better person, as a better human, as a better employee, as a better whatever. Uh, and so it's it's with that contract environment, you get a very flexible or the ability to have a very flexible schedule to pursue some of that diversity. Uh, and I mentioned it a few times. It's something that I take a lot of pride in. Uh, it lends itself very nicely. You know, rope is rope is rope, whether you're hanging from a steel girders of an industrial site, whether you're hanging from a tree, whether you're, you know, in the back country doing a rescue, it's, it's all very attributable. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways to get involved in various organizations and, and take some of that, you know, opportunity when it presents itself. So uh, yeah, trail yeah. building, you were out even like harvesting what cones off of Ponderosas or BC. That yeah. was cool little project. We're doing some scion harvesting. Uh, and yeah, there's all sorts of stuff you can get involved in, right? It's, it's, you know, you start to hone your craft and become super efficient and learn everything there is to do across a myriad of different areas. And, and it all applies towards opening up doors and making new opportunities for you. So I think Johnny yeah. went over or trained people that were going overseas, climbing trees and taking photos of different like wildlife for research totally. and like just yeah. Yeah. all sorts of cool stuff once you know how to use a harness and ropes properly. But totally awesome, buddy. Well, thanks very much uh yeah, for chatting with me again i hope this was valuable for everyone maybe a little drier with some of the business stuff but i think if you're uh, going that route it's gonna be pretty valuable so we'll meet up again for episode three we're gonna discuss some maybe some lessons learned uh that you've had or we both had throughout our careers here mm -hmm. some new ideas uh and the future that sort of thing so yeah Anything you want to touch on there that we haven't uh, talked about yet, definitely save it for episode three. Totally. Yeah. Yep. I got some thoughts, but I'll All right. contain myself. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Sounds good. So if everyone's looking to reach out to Sean, uh, why don't you give us your your ways that we can contact you with any questions, that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, the website's there. Like I said earlier, I haven't really touched it, but www rockyarb.ca it's out there. It's in the world. You can find it. Uh, I've got my email and my phone number on the website as well. Uh, biggest kind of easiest forum of communication with me is probably Instagram. Uh, and it's just at Rocky mountain arborist, uh, is the Instagram handle. I'm somewhat active kind of ebbs and flows a little bit, but, uh, I'm on there. I'm usually there, you know, daily to at least check messages and communicate and connect with other like-minded folks. So that's probably your best bet. Uh, but yeah, reach out, get in touch. Love to hear from you. Sweet, man. Same for me. If anybody wants to reach out, uh, at Kurt the Arborist, at Arborist Blueprint, at Atmos Tree, <laughs> at Cochrane Tree Care. I'm going to need to hire someone to start looking after all this social media well, stuff for me. It's ridiculous. This is my question. Talking of work life balance, is how do you manage multiple flipping social yeah. media accounts? Well, sometimes and... you got to funnel it all into, you know, a year or something, and then it's going to. Yeah. It's going to start working itself out here and make some more time. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm enjoying the, I'm enjoying the busyness right now, but yeah, I definitely can't sustain it forever. So, but yeah, I, I just gotta, just gotta make this transition here a little bit and then it'll be all good. So yeah. Anybody uh, reach out to me. I'm always happy to chat and uh, talk about this kind of stuff. So, okay, buddy. Thanks again. Right on brother.
Deal.